So, Bismillah, before we go into the class, I want to mention two things very quickly and then we'll go into the class. Uh, number one, I mentioned there's a litmus test and the litmus test, uh, based upon a saying of the Prophet, as you'll see, is that those people that are part of the New World Order agenda, one of the ways to measure them based upon this tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to see who went all out hook, line, sinker with the idea of the pandemic really being the pandemic okay and then i said well those who didn't go with the 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 script of the pandemic may hold some more integrity than those that do well it came to my attention that uh well it happens that russia is targeting what russia is targeting um u.s bioweapon facilities, defense bio facilities in Ukraine. And they are doing this because Russia and China have both said and have been saying and decrying that the US is playing is playing with bioweapons. And uh, so there is uh, now, you know, you can look this up on the internet, but now there are pictures uh, showing the uh, the bioweapons. Let me just do that for my Telegram channel. Okay. And so Russian military destroys USA's naval operations center in Ukraine. Okay. And uh, and there are these bioweapons that were being made at the border. So other viruses would be spread. And this type of fifth generation military, uh, you know, man-made uh, viruses and so on and so forth was a big threat. And the point being that if Putin was on the New World Order um, program, he would not attack these bioweapons, as these bioweapons have been used to bring down the economy of the world. This is the first point. Second point I want to make, directly or indirectly, consequently, uh, an unintended uh, consequence is that now that Russia has invaded Ukraine, uh, China will likely take steps to invade Ch Taiwan and Hong Kong and other places. And likewise, other countries will that have the power will do so. Israel will see this as a an excuse to probably go ahead with its plans against Iran, which is a whole discussion I need to have. But these are the points I wanted to make. Now, in the classroom setting, I go over verses of Quran, point by point, discussing a few important questions. The first question is, the Christians, how do you know who are the Christians you can trust? And how are the, do you know which are the Christians you can't trust? What does the Quran say about the Judeo-Christian civilization that we live in? Is the world unipower world or does like one source control all things or is there mel multiple forces out there playing against each other? Is it the Hegelian dialectic? Is it, uh, you know, um, institutions or agents creating chaos to bring about their new world order? you know, order out of chaos uh, type of thought? Or is there actual entities and ideologies that are all uh, vying against one another? Then we also look at the Quran uh, from other perspectives. We look at the history of the USSR and the change of USSR into Russia, what it means, what is the place of Ukraine in this. We talk about Putin and his relationship with the Jews and Zionism. Uh, is he, does he have a, a human relationship or is he part of a movement? Okay. Um, and so we look at that. And like this, we tackle a few important questions about, and then some students ask me some questions about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, some questions about the Mahdi. Um, those were there also. So it's, it's overall a pretty good discussion, inshallah ta'ala, that will benefit many people because these are the questions that are in the minds of the people. But I wanted to focus more on Russia and Ukraine. And so that's what I did. And, uh, and so you will see the points and how Quran guides us 
in answering these questions for the people that are willing to engage the Qur'an as their source, uh, inshallah. May Allah make us of those people that Qur'an opens up to more and more and more and more and more, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, so I also want to, and I pray that the result of this conversation for many of you will be uh, a clarification, uh, a reinforcement, okay, this is what's happening, but also being inspired that, oh, Qur'an tells us about real things happening in the real world and inspires us to see things as they really are. Qur'an is the way of the truth. And so this is what I'm hoping for, inshallah ta'ala. Um, if you feel like it, also, uh, you know, you can become part of my Telegram channel and join the Telegram channel and join the community. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen Muhammadin al-Ameen amma ba'd. Qala azza wa jal, wa qalat al-Yahudu laysat al-Nasara ala shay, wa qalat al-Nasara laysat al-Yahudu ala shay, wa hum yatlun al-Kitab. إلى آخر الآية رب الشهر صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب. So today we want to understand how we can apply the Quran to understand um, the situation that is occurring between Russia and Ukraine, or technically has already occurred. But this is a very important conversation because um, we're going to cover a lot of important uh, concepts and. And, and topics. The first one, and, and I'll try to make the class fast, but sometimes I might take a little bit um, longer because uh, of trying to show you the resources that uh, I have with me. And sometimes they're on my phone and not on the computer. So it might take a little time to uh, bring out the resources. So I'm going to use this browser because it's important to show the Quranic verses. So I would rather do that. Okay. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, Muhammadin al-Ameen. Amma ba'd fa'awudh billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So... In the very beginning, I want to show everyone the following from the Qur'an. So the Qur'an on the one side says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودِ And the Jews, they say, لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَ عَلَى شَيْءِ The Nasara, the, the Jews say, the Christians, they have nothing. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ And the Christians say لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ يَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ And the Christians say the Jews have nothing. They have no claim. They have no knowledge. They have no understanding of anything. وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ الْكِتَابِ While they're both reading the same book, meaning the Old Testament, the Bible, portions of the book are same for both. So how can you say someone has absolutely no uh, claim when you're reading the same book? So this is one verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows that the Jews and the Christians, they have a very uh, different understanding. You'll see where this is going, inshallah ta'ala. So on the one side, Quran is saying, look, the Jews are saying Christians have no understanding. And the Christians say, the Jews have no understanding. On the other side, they say, Qalu, they say, Jannah. You will not enter Jannah You won't enter Jannah unless you are a Jew or a Christian. 
Tilka amaniyuhum, these are their own fancy ideas. Ulhatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqin. And bring your proof if you are truthful. So, what do we see here between these two verses? Ayah number 111 and 113. Now, those of you that have been studying a little bit about Quran and numerology will be interested that it is uh, the, the anyway, we'll come to that later. But on the one side, there is a group that says you will not enter Jannah unless you are a Jew or a Christian. Meaning, if you read now, let me clarify this. Shaulila Muhaddas Delvi in his book of Tafsir called Fawzul Kabir Fi Asul Tafsir says there are two types of two basic categories of interpretation. Okay, one is you're looking you're looking at the ayah and when it was revealed, why it was revealed, under what circumstances it revealed, and what it tells you about specifically Sharia, what rules you get. Like the ayat of Qibla, changing like this. The second is Ta'wilul Am. Ta'wilul Am is a general interpretation without looking at the background. What is the Quran telling you on its own? Okay. In Ta'wilul Am, if you look at this verse again, it is not hard to see that when they say that you will not enter Jannah unless you be a Christian or be a Jew, could be very easily be referring to what we today call the Judeo-Christian civilization. So I have to let some people in. Okay. So I number 111 says وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ You won't enter Jannah illa except man kana hudan al nasara A time will come. Now, let me give you the historical background of this from the perspective of history. The Jews and the Christians never got along. And the Christians always persecuted the Jews. This has been the history for the last 2,000 years. And the Jews always lived in the slums. This was the result of partly of why Germany reacted to the Jewish people. Because you see, to the Christians, especially the Christians of the past, who are the Jews? You killed our God. And if you ever talk to white nationalists, for example, uh, when they talk about degrading the people who are the worst, you know, the 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 Jew is worse than the black man to the person who's a white supremacist because to him, the Jewish people, they killed their God. Anyway, now it's everything has changed around because of this Bible called the Scaffold Bible, which I'll one day talk about. But it's now in all of the seminaries, the Madaris of the Christian world, which now gives a different view. But the point being, that the Quran is saying that they say if you be a Jew or a Christian, you'll enter Jannah. And then on the other side, Quran is telling us about a different type of Christianity. And this Christianity says, وَقَالَتْ الْيَهُودِ And the Jews, and this is perhaps also a different type of Jews. A type of Jews that sees differently from the way Christians see. And a type of Christianity that sees things differently from the way the Jews or from the way other Christians see. And then there is a type of Christianity that would come into history and a type of Judaism that would come into history that would see things in a similar way, like there is a group of Christian Zionists and there is in the world a group of uh, Jewish Zionists who agree on the idea of Zionism. Now, this is a whole topic in itself. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but I'm showing you the Quranic verses that 
show us that, and historically, I want this to be clear, that it's, as Christianity spread around the world, the Christianity that went to Africa was very different from the Christianity that went to Europe. Well, in Europe, you had St. Paul, and because of St. Paul, things were, uh, you know, twisted a little bit. So th therefore, what happened as a result, uh, what happened as a result was that Najashi's response to the Prophet ﷺ, Najashi's response to the Prophet was very different from Hercules' response to the Prophet. Even though Hercules' response to the Prophet would be very different from the Roman Catholic response today. No. So, there are many verses in the Quran that point to this. I'm going to show you another verse. So, the first point I'm trying to make is that should be understood very, very clearly. That what? That even the Quran is pointing to, when you read it carefully, that there is more than there is more than one type of Christianity specifically, and also more than one type of Judaism. This is going to become more important when we discuss the personality of Putin and his relationship with the Jewish community. Now, this is going to be a long conversation, and but I want it to be understood point by point. So uh, I'm going to try not to go too long, but after I make one point, I'll open it up for discussion. So while people are asking me the questions, I can try to get ready for the next, uh, as I'm answering them, I'll get ready for the next point. So the first point I'm making that I want it to be very clear is that there is a Judeo-Christian alliance religion, and then there is a Christianity and Judaism that maintain their i i their uh, their separate identities okay and so in different times these things may converge and not converge and in the same way you find for example in ayah number 120 ولن and you will not find the Jews and the Christians ever being happy with you until you follow their civilization. And I translate the word milla different from ummah in a sense that milla represents actually closer to what we can call a civilization. And the Judeo-Christian civilization will never be happy with you. They will never uh, be happy with you. And so they will always say to the Muslim world, we need more from you and we need more from you. And can you do this for us? And can you fight this war for us? And can you do this for us? And can you make these changes in your society for us. And the Jews and the Christians, they'll never be happy with you until, uh, until you completely follow their milla, their civil life. You become like them. That's what they want. They want you to eat like them, talk like them, dress like them, all that. Say, look, the guidance is the guidance that comes from Allah. If you had followed their desires, after what has come to you, O Nabi Muhammad وسلم, of knowledge, then you would have had no protector or any helper. So, these, this portion of the Qur'an, particularly this part of Surah Al-Baqarah, makes it clear that there would be two types of Christianities and therefore two types of Judaism 
And one of those forms is a type of Judaism and Christianity that forms an alliance. And those Christians or those Jews that want to maintain their identity as Christian and Jews, they will say, because they have a separate identity and therefore a separate hermeneutics, a separate logic, a separate uh, you know, sense of what is salvation and et cetera, et cetera, all the other theological questions. So therefore what will happen is that they will say this person has no claim. The Jews will say the Christians have nothing. And the Christians will say the Jews have nothing. Okay. Even though they're reading the same book. Now, there are other verses in the Quran that also show this contrast between the you know the the spectrum you can say of different types of christianities and different types of judaisms so but these verses make it abundantly clear that there will be a spectrum of where the jews and the christians meet as allies and creating not only that they come as allies and not only do they say to be a jew or christian means you can enter jannah but they actually form a millah, they form a civilization. Uh, and they ask and they expect the Muslims in particular to follow that civilization. And then you have another spectrum that is maintaining its Jewish, uh, Judaic and Christian uh, characteristics. And they don't uh, have those qualities as we will talk soon, inshallah. Um, okay, so now, this is my first point to this kind of like a, a Christianity and a Judaism that converge versus a Judaism and Christianity that do not converge and maintain their separate identities. And this Judeo-Christian uh, alliance or civilization, how they look at the Muslim world and what they want from the Muslim world. So this is my if somebody can now uh, say yes, I, I think this point is clear. Uh, maybe help me understand things better. So if anybody has any comments on what I've said so far, then uh, please I'll allow like one or two or three people to say something. And, uh, and then we'll continue to point number two as we're discussing this, um, this, uh, this point, uh, the next point. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, Sheikh, I have a, you know, uh, a point to make. Yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, Sheikh Imran once uh, connected this uh, alliance of uh, Judeo-Christians uh, from the uh, Surah, in Surah Rahman, uh, the 36 times uh, the ayah which is repeated, uh, which is... Uh, Yes. Yeah. So uh, we can we can connect this to that also. Um, about uh, but in that uh, surah, it is also mentioned about the jinn and the insan. So yes. I, I have a confusion. I'm, today, well, uh, we might discuss that when we talk a little bit about the Pharaoh paradigm and all of this. Um, let's see if we get there today. But today I'm specifically focusing on understanding Ukraine and Russia and how the Quran is going to look at this. Now, in the real world, as uh, you mentioned, Sheikh Imran Hussein, may Allah preserve him. But what becomes abundantly clear is in the world today, there are two uh, different types of Christianities, right? So there is a Christianity that is in a, Jude in a complete Judeo-Christian alliance. And then there's a Christianity that is trying to rediscover, you can say, itself, which is uh, Russia, the East Eastern Orthodox bloc, which I'm going to talk about in, in a little bit more later on. But this Eastern bloc is, re is reviving its, because they were under communism, spirituality was suppressed, 
So these people are very thirsty and they happen to be an area where Orthodox Christianity is, is, is the way things are. Okay. And so there's this revival of Christianity that is taking place there. Now, uh, the question that I will add to that is that are there other places that fit this description besides uh, the Eastern Orthodox bloc? And the answer is yes, there are many of these similar places, for example, in Africa, where Christians and Muslims have gotten along and they have no Judeo-Christian alliance. In Africa, there are many uh, of those, okay? And um, then let's say uh, in America, there could be, uh, those Christians that are not Zionists, those Christians that are pro, they would be basically religious, but on what we usually call the democratic side. Um, those Christians in America that are that have a democratic bend, so they're not on the Zionist uh, pathway. They're not evangelicals. Um, and so they, they have a possibility of being there. But those are like small pockets in America. It's not the majority. The majority is Protestant, very Zionist, very pro-Zionist. Um, and I can go a lot into the details of that. Um, yes. So, uh, Brother H uh, Hussein? Yes, sir. <coughs> yes. Did you have something to say? No, no I, I just asked. Uh, it's clear, Sheikh. Thank you. Okay, uh, Brother Mujahid. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Hope you're well. Um, so I've come across some, some Christian groups who are based in Ireland. So traditionally, they're like Catholic. Um, that's the version of Christianity that they follow. But they're kind of sitting on the fence at this stage, from what, I've, from what I understand, as in they're questioning the, like, the Catholic beliefs. And it seems like they're heading more towards the Orthodox side. Um, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on that group, as in, no, the Catholics or any other Christians that are kind of moving away from their original identity towards the more orthodox. What are your views, views on that group? Yeah, so uh, a lot of Catholics are in a, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual crisis. And because of this spiritual crisis, they're basically looking for something new. So you'll find that a lot of people that convert to Islam even are Catholics. Okay, and it's not, uh, it's not a surprise that Catholics uh, would move towards Orthodox Christianity uh, as an alternative. And the reason is simply because it, if you're looking for the truth, you have to look back. And if you're looking back, then you'll find Orthodox Christianity within the framework of Christianity and its history. So, you know, Orthodox Christianity is closer to its past than any of these new uh, Protestant versions. So, yeah, Catholics uh, are in a great uh, crisis, and uh, they're in a spiritual crisis, and uh, it's going it's going to be interesting to see how they can now that they've also opened up to the gays and the and you know uh, all these other things they're opening up to them that uh, um, you know th th it's just becomes a name, but there's no real no real spirit that's holding them together. Um, uh, yes, Dr. Imtiaz. Hello. Yes, assalamu alaikum. Hello, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh, I have a, a question. Like, I was reading a hadith, and I came across, uh, like, I just, uh, while reading it, I just came to know that during end time, maybe just before the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi, Ramatullah uh, there will be two large group of Christians fighting with each other. Okay. And then uh, the, the king or the Badshah, the king of the room, the Muslim country will be uh, assigning with one of the particular uh, Christian group and uh, will be fighting the, uh, will be fighting against the second one. Okay. Then the group uh, who, you know, where the uh, king, the Muslim country aligns align with the Christian, they wins. Okay. Then after that, uh, they will come near a hill and, and uh, they will rest. 
then of the Christian will say we have won because of the power of cross. And then the one of the Muslim uh, army will you know, get up and break the cross. And then what, what will happen? The alliance will break off. And then the two Christians which are fighting with each other, they will become one big group. Okay. And they will kill this particular uh, entire Muslim army. Okay. Then this particular, uh, then, then what, what will happen will, uh, then the big, bigger things happen like around 80 flags uh, with 12,000 uh, army under each flag banner will assemble and they'll try to invade. And most probably that time, Imam Mahdi al-Islam will appear by that time. So I need some information actually, is it, uh, it is, is it the current scenario where the Orthodox Christianity and the Catholic Western one fighting with each other? Uh, maybe Turkey is was the old room. So Turkey Erdogan, is he the king? Maybe he will be siding with, he'll be having alliance with Russia or with uh, the Western countries, NATO, something I just a bit confused. I need some, uh, need some help over here. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this tradition of the prophet and try to understand it in its uh, proper context. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'll just do the English translation for now. The part that you want to emphasize or uh, point out is that then a man among the Muslims will become angry and will go and break the cross. Then the Romans will prove treacherous, breaking the treaty and will gather for a fierce battle. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, and so a man from the Muslims, he will, what? He will become angry and he will, what? Uh, break the cross, okay? And يَغْدِرُ uh, room and the Romans will do غَدَر, uh, they will do treachery. وَيَجْتَمِعُونَ uh, so then they will gather together to butcher the Muslims. Okay. Let us understand the saying of the Prophet in this case. Bismillah. I'm not going to talk in detail about this, but I, it's good that we touch upon this since we're talking about Christianity and Muslims and so on and so forth. The way to process this this hadith will help a lot of people as an example on how to process information. Is it right for a Muslim in any circumstances to say or to break the cross? Is it right as a Muslim for me or you or anyone to grow and break the cross? No. No. So definitely not. Okay. Why? Yes. It is because the Quran says what? Do not if you yeah. Do not, do not rebuke, disrespect. Do not rebuke, if you insult their gods, then they will insult Allah. Exactly. So if a Muslim does that, he is doing something wrong. Number two. Who else will break the cross according to the traditions of the Prophet? Is anyone Isa else going to break the cross? Isa 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 uh, Isa is going to break the cross. I, I'm going to ban the pigs or kill the pigs. Right. So we have to ask the question, is that metaphorical or is that physical? Meaning, is there a physical cross he's going to break? Or is there going to actually be, it's, it's a metaphorical idea and in this I, hadith, yeah. is it metaphorical or is it uh, actual meaning when this man goes breaks a cross does he actually grow and break a cross or does he start refuting uh, them refuting yeah. christianity uh as in a way that uh now we find in this hadith that man will act in anger 
And whatever he does, he will do in anger. And then they will respond in anger. The result should be that looking at this hadith, we should stay quiet. The reason is because he's not doing something according to the Quran. Or rather, he's acting against the Quran. So was the Prophet telling us of something treacherous a Muslim man will do that will hurt us? And then they will, you know, as a result of a Muslim's treachery, we will be hurt. Because obviously, if Muslims and Christians have an alliance and we fight together, they're fighting with their belief and we're fighting with our belief. And then we have victory. Both sides are going to naturally think that, oh, this happened because even though technically it can be argued, we believe in the same God. It can be argued, but I'm not going to go there. Let's say if we don't believe in the same God. But each party will think that what? We, uh, we won because of our, uh, our, spiritual, uh, our spirituality, our aqidah. So this man breaking the cross goes against the Islamic injunctions. So if there is, because one man, because if these are spiritual people, if they're spiritual Christians, who Quran calls that they would be humble if they're spiritual. And if there is spiritual Muslims, at that time they are people fighting in the cause of Allah or they're fighting for uh, some cause that is justified, then uh, to have individuals like this on both sides goes against the overwhelming reason, in addition to the fact that it goes against the nazam, the, the type of sama wa ata that an Islamic army would have, meaning you cannot just go and break their cross without talking to the emir or without taking permission from the emir. So this hadith uh, may be correct. Okay, it may be correct. And simply, it's something we don't understand if it's correct. But if we were to take it on its face value, it goes against and it's telling us something against the Islamic principles. Okay. Now there's a lot more to be said about this, but what I want us to understand is something else. Okay. That when there is a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, like this, telling us something of the future, and it has something in it that contradicts the Quran, then you have to ask yourself because hold on, I want to say this. Mulaqari Ali Rahmatullah one of the greatest scholars of Islamic jurisprudence, greatest in his uh, enumeration of weak ahadith and his enumeration of forgeries within hadith, he specifically mentions, which is why we have to be very careful, what he mentions specifically uh, ahadith that talk about the future. Okay? Ahadith that relate to Islamic eschatology. They have been, there has been more, you can say, uh, attempts to change that. And anyone can understand from a spiritual perspective why shaitan would focus on that. You know, why would shaitan focus on something so we forget, for example, the name of Qustuntunya, and now we call it Islam boat. So this is what Islam, this is what how Shaitan works. Shaitan will put something, one word or another word, that will cause confusion and not be able to understand if you're only looking at the one thing. So what you have to do to bypass this is you have to put everything together and see the pieces that easily fit, put them all together, and see what picture that gives you, and then see the things that don't fit, where they can, and how they can fit. Okay, so, okay, so let's consider this hadith, this discussion about this hadith, as point number two, okay? So, uh, before I move forward, uh, okay, I'll let Brother Abdullah speak, and then after that, I want anyone who wants to comment on this specific hadith of the Prophet, where it says the Muslims and Christians will have an alliance, a Muslim will break the cross, and then there will be 
treachery after that. Okay. So, yes, Brother Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Hello? Yes, I'm listening. Yes, Brother Abdullah. Hello? Hello? Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Yes, I'm listening, Brother. Yeah, so basically, I have a question about <clears throat> this ayah in the Quran, the Surah Al Ali Imran, right? In the Dina, in the Islam, right? Um, so, Orthodox Christianity, even if they believe in the Trinity, right? In the Dina, in the Islam, is at the end of the day, Islam is the only religion in the eyes of Allah. Meaning that since the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the last Nabi, right? And he was sent for all of mankind. And the Quran is the last book for the whole of mankind. That's what the right aqidah is, right? Not any orthodox religion other than the religion of what Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught with the Quran, right? Since it's the last two things. Okay. Very good question. Alhamdulillah. So the answer is yes, but it's at two different levels. In the deen in the law is Islam. The deen with Allah is Islam. And it always has been Islam. Meaning Islam is not something that came with Prophet Muhammad, but it came with Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay? Rather, even before that, everything was surrendering to Allah. Now, these two levels are as follows. And this is the difference between the Ashariya Aqidah and the Maturidi, Maturidi Aqidah. Maturidi. The question is, are you responsible to obey a prophet and to believe in Allah? Um, are you responsible to believe in Allah and the prophet and the day of judgment? Or let me just put it this way. Are you responsible to believe in Allah before a prophet comes to you? Yes or no? Meaning, if no prophet comes to you, are you still responsible in recognizing Allah? Yes. So the Maturi yes. Aqidah says, yes, you are. And so the example of that in the Quran is Luqman alayhi salatu wasalam. Luqman was not a prophet, nor any prophet came to him, nor any book came to him, but he recognized there's Allah. And so this person even though he's technically not in Islam, but he has surrendered to Allah. I believe you're there. I see your signs. I know you're merciful. You give me everything I have. But he's received no message of the Prophet. And he's received no Sharia, no <clears throat> Prophet, no book of Allah. Luqman didn't receive Sharia. He didn't receive a Prophet. He didn't receive any book. But we know he's going to Jannah. Okay. What about the Orthodox Christians? If there is an Orthodox Christian or anybody for that, anybody who is born on Fitra and lives on Fitra, he, Fitra means he recognizes Allah exists, but he never heard about Islam. And the Hujjah of Islam is not on him, meaning the argument of Islam, because one thing that needs to be made clear is that who does the difference between the word kafir in Islamic law and the word kafir in Quran? They're very different. A kafir is a category of human beings who, if they come to the Islamic court, they're not Muslims. Okay? A kafir is somebody who's simply not Muslim. A kafir in Quran. The one who is a kafir has two meanings. In fact, the word iman, the, the word kufr has two opposites in Quran. One opposite of the word kufr in Quran is iman. Inna ladina amanu, thumma kafaru. Thumma amanu, thumma kafaru. Thumma zdadu kufra. So the opposite of iman is kufr. Number one. Number two, the opposite of iman is shukr. In this very same verse about, Luk, in, about Luqman, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُكْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَلِّيُّ الْحَمِيدِ It's the dahar. إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا We created you to see who will be thankful. 
and who will do kufr, who will be ungrateful, who will be un unthankful. So the Quranic terminology of kafir, ya kafir, right? kafirun. The Quranic terminology of the word kafirun and kafir means the people that opposed the Prophet. So listen to what I'm saying. The Quranic terminology of the word kafirun means the people that opposed the Prophet actively. And those people that did not oppose the Prophet actively are called jahilun in Quran, in Surah Al-Fat, for example, and Surah Al-Ahzab also. Those people who didn't, they didn't believe in him. They're listening. They haven't made up their mind. Maybe their hearts are inclined. Maybe their hearts are not inclined. But they're not opposing the Prophet. They, up till that time, the Surah is revealed, meaning Surah Al-Fat, which is in time of Hudaybiyah, up till that time they're being considered jahil. They don't know. Okay. And the people that are opposing the Prophet, actively opposing, they're called kafir in the Quran. So just so you, this is Allah, this is why Allah says, in the kafaru sawa'una alayhim anzartam amlam tundrim la yu'minun. Whether those people that have done, that are kuffar or kafir that are opposing the prophet, it is all the same to them. Whether you warn them or don't warn them, they will not believe. And la yu'minun. They're not going to believe because they've already decided to not listen to the prophet. They've already decided to oppose the prophet. So in the Quranic terminology, kafir, what that means, and in Islamic law. Islamic law also. Let me switch it around now. I'm sorry the discussion is going here, but it's also an important discussion. Somebody comes to an Islamic court, says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Is he Muslim? Yes, he's Muslim. But what if he's a spy? He's still Muslim. He can marry a Muslim girl. He can inherit from a Muslim father, for example. He can, he's basically Muslim. His janazah will be read, even though he was a spy. He will be a munafiq. He will know inside, I'm not Muslim, but outside, he's Muslim. So why am, I, why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this, that the category of Muslim in the Sharia, in terms of the court system, who is Muslim, has nothing to do with, you can't go to an Islamic court and say, by the way, my iman is very heavy. My iman is very strong. Please, uh, I will get more inheritance than the other person because their iman is not as strong as mine. You can't do that. In Islam, and this is the very ancient argument, does iman increase or decrease? So the legally, iman doesn't increase or decrease. He said the shahada, I said the shahada. Internally, my feeling is increasing and decreasing and his feeling of iman is increasing and decreasing. But legally, when I'm in front of the court, we're the same. He's a Muslim, I'm the same. All Muslims are same in front of the court. So iman doesn't increase or decrease in front of the court. The iman can't measure your, the court can't measure your iman. I'm saying this, so the whole matter is clear to you. What is the word? What is the word kafir in Islamic law, in the Islamic court? We will deal with people based upon their dahir, what we know of them. Is it possible that we call somebody a kafir from the legal perspective? For me, you're a kafir. But he is living, he doesn't know Islam. He has not, the, the hujjah of Islam has not been done on him. He's not clear Islam is the truth. He uh, doesn't know Prophet Muhammad. He doesn't know the Quran. He doesn't know Islam. But he's a kafir. But he, in his heart, in his prayers at night, he does dua to Allah. He says, thank you to Allah. He says, Allah, forgive me, oh Allah. He, in his own life, he's living on fitrah. Again, fitrah is not something we can measure. But he, in his own private life, he, is a, he, he has a relationship in the belief of Allah. And he doesn't know Islam is the truth. And because he is, uh, he is on fitrah, and if he was to know Islam is the truth, he would follow it because that's human fitrah is to follow the truth. You know, truth is a big part of human fitrah. And, uh, you know, this is one of the problems with uh, the secular world is they've suppressed this human need to find the truth. Everything is relative. 
that the human need to find the truth has been suppressed. And so human beings are not searching for the truth in the modern times, but that's, that's a different issue. The point I'm trying to make is this man by Islamic court is a kafir, but inside he believes in Allah, but he doesn't know Islam is the truth. Does this person have a chance on the day of judgment? This is the question. And the answer is, it seems so. At least uh, Maturidiya will say yes. And the ayat regarding uh, Luqman Hakim also seem to suggest yes. So even though he's a kafir, but he's on fitwa. So same too with other categories. Somebody who doesn't know Islam is true, but no matter what their um, other uh, creeds are with what they're born, as long as they're on fitrah, as long as they recognize one Allah, as long as they're repenting to Allah, so they have a chance. They may go to the hellfire, like Muslims, for because Allah said, Allah Allah will not forgive that shirk is done with him. So for shirk, they have to pay the price. But then after that, what happens? That's between Allah and them on the day of judgment. Just like many Muslims do shirk. Many Muslims, they bow down to graves. So they, they, they did shirk, but they, didn't, they were not mushrik, meaning they were not idol worshippers. Okay. I hope, am I clear on this question? Uh, Sheikh, uh, sorry, sorry to ask you, uh, last question. Okay. What yeah. about the parents of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Because they all died uh, before Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received the prophethood. Yes. So the ulama, they disagree on this question. And, you know, why open topics that are only going to create wounds? Yeah. Meaning the ulama disagree. I mean, if I, if I ask you a simple question. Number one question I would ask anybody asking me this question is that would the prophet be happy with discussing this question? Have you ever talked to a Christian who became Muslim and the agony they go through when they think about their parents? And you know this Christian is in front of you who became Muslim. He is in pain because his parents are not Muslim. Now you want to discuss in front of him, oh, by the way, your parents are going to the hellfire. It's against our general adab to uh, take the prophet in that place, number one. Number two, if the prophet's parents died believing in him, meaning uh, if you take the riwayat, if you take the riwayat of that uh, the mother of the prophet saw uh, Nur coming out of her uh, pregnancy. If you take the riwayat that uh, Halima, when she was taking the prophet and all of a sudden she had baraka in her life and her donkey that wasn't moving fast at all was the slowest donkey all of a sudden became, you know, this uh, very fast and the, story, and the prophet's narration that these angels came and ripped uh, my chest and 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 sewed my back. chest and 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 sewed so now the question being that if the amna the prophet's mother is hearing this did she believe that her son was special and that whatever that specialness meant that she believed in him did she die saying things that is in narrations that you know you're going to be a special child as she's dying, uh, when the Prophet وسلم, in on the day of Hatul Makkah, the few days before, he spent almost an entire night on the grave of his mother, crying. Uh, so I don't think it's uh, meaning I, I'm not Allah, I don't know. She may go to the hellfire or she may go to Jannah. I have a, I tr will try to have a good opinion for the prophet. It's not in my interest uh, to brag or to uh, make claims that the prophet's mother or father is going to heaven or hell. It's, uh, you know, it's against our adab. And we hope, inshallah, 
that Allah allowed her to do something or say something or her acceptance of her child as a special child, that Allah has some compensation for that. But in the end, who knows? I don't know. Sheikh, yeah, uh, Sheikh. Allah, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all merciful. He can do anything he wants. He can give Jannah to anybody he wants. He can give Hilfah to anybody he wants. Yeah, of course. Sheikh, if, if, if a Christian person uh, comes to know about Islam but doesn't accept, what's the fate of that person? If he was given da'wah by a right person and convinced him, and for a moment he had, he's like, this is the truth. His heart said, and his heart gave him evidence or assurance that this is the truth. And he didn't accept it. Now he's in trouble. Now he's in deep trouble. Um, I wanted to take this conversation in terms of Ukraine and Russia. So we need to get back to that topic, inshallah, quickly. But I'll let uh, Brother Abdullah and then Strategic Eschatology um, speak, inshallah, very quickly. Yes, Brother Abdullah? Yeah, assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, like I'm just really confused about this topic sometimes. Um, hearing Sheikh Imran Hussain's uh, May Allah Preserve Him speeches and then also your speech, I, I noticed kind of a different approach towards okay. Orthodox Christianity to some extent, right? So, for example, for uh, the video called Turkey and the Great War uh, by Imran Hussain, right? I, and I quote him, he says that um, to the Orthodox Christians that you know, you'll come to realize that we have our lines together. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to follow our Nabi. You can still follow Prophet Isa, but we'll be in alliance together, right? But then, like, I don't know, it's a knocking always on my head because there's also another ayah in the Quran where Allah says, Islam dina right? That this is the Islam that Allah chose. For the rest of mankind, right? Because since Allah this is the last, but, minhu is referring to this world or the next world. Um, I, like, I don't know. Can you correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, lan yakbala minhu will not be accepted for him on the day of judgment. Okay, but in this world, can we have an alliance with Ahlul Kitab? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to actually talk about this in great detail. If you just have a little patience, because I this is exactly because the Prophet gave us. Very, very specific instructions regarding the Christians. Okay. Like I, I wanted to show you, and I'll show you, there are contracts between the Prophet and the Christians of Najran and other monks that the Prophet wrote. Abu Bakr signed, Ali signed, Omar signed. The Prophet said about his life, he said to the Muslims in a speech where he said this. The Prophet said that the the Christians were never treacherous to me in my life. Meaning, what he's saying is, another party has been treacherous to him. They made contracts with him, like Misak al Medina, right? And they made contracts with him. They make alliances with him, and then they betray him. But the Prophet said, وسلم, the Christians, they made alliances with me, and they always kept their alliance. So he told the Muslims, all Muslims, that I want you on behalf of me, that the respect that they offered me, for you to offer the same kindness that they did to me, that you offered them. So even though, Quranically, they come under the broad category of Ahlul Kitab, and there's a very broad category as we've already discussed, but certain groups of Christians that kept their alliance to the Prophet, meaning that type of Christianity, the Prophet was very uh, respectful, very respectful to that. And uh, so we have to, on behalf of the Prophet, keep this in mind. I'll, I'll show you the references for this, inshallah, as we discuss this issue, because this is one of the things I actually had in mind that I was going to discuss was specifically what the Prophet had written in contract to the people of Najran and what the Prophet had written in contract to other, like we're talking about 
uh, there is monasteries in the Sinai Peninsula. There are monasteries around Ar Arabia that still have that intact and signed by the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu And this was maintained until the Ottomans, meaning they took that contract that was written as, okay, this is Prophet Muhammad's contract with us. This is how much we owe. Nothing will be made difficult for us, etc., etc. Okay? So, in dunya, we want people to get close to us and have alliance to us because this is one of the ways of da'wah. This is one of the ways of da'wah. One of the ways, meaning, I don't bring someone to Islam, you don't bring someone to Islam. And I don't decide someone's fate in the hereafter, nor does anybody else. But my job is to convey the message. And my job is to prove to them Islam is the truth. For me to do that, I have to have some sort of relationship. And alliance offers that relationship. Now, how do you decide who you should have a relationship with in terms of priorities? The people that are closest to you, people that are closest to you, they're going to be the easiest to convince. Who as a people within the Quranic context are closest to us, therefore will be easier to convince this is the truth. I would say that they're closest group to us is going to be besides you know of course relatives or in the immediate neighborhood but in the the larger geopolitical context the people that are closest to us that we can have a, a shared uh conversation most easily transferred between us and them is the orthodox christians okay because why because they're humble they're not arrogant they're not in alliance with the Jews, right? They're not Zionists. And uh, they have a lot of common things in their book, our book, that we can then discuss and try to come to a conclusion. So it's not that they don't become Muslim if they don't accept Islam. But if we have a, an alliance for more than, for, first of all, let's understand this. Did the Prophet do an alliance with the Quraysh who were pagan worshippers? Did, did he? Yes. Uh, okay. At the Mecca. Right. So the alliance can be done with anybody. Alliance can be done with anybody. But it is better when it is with people that you have something in common with. Let me give this from another perspective. Again, I wanted to talk about Ukraine and Russia, but these topics, I guess, are important too. Is a Muslim man allowed to marry a Christian girl? Yes. If she is church going, she believes in the Bible, she's chaste, not like just any Christian, okay? Not just any Christian lady. And my opinion is nowadays, even that should be avoided because there's too many Muslim girls who are not married. So that's a separate issue um, but a man can marry a Jewish or a Christian girl he can eat from her food assuming that she's orthodox and, and will follow those rules um, he can marry her he can eat from her food or we can eat from their food like the kosher food of the certain Jews so does that mean that because I'm eating their food or I'm marrying a, a Christian girl or I'm marrying a Jewish girl, that, that means that, uh, we, that because she's not Muslim, I cannot marry her? No, it doesn't mean that. But what will happen with her on the Day of Judgment? She lived her whole life with me. She learned about Islam with me. She still didn't become Muslim. Because the whole, I, one of the, of the maqasid of Sharia is that why you can marry somebody from these groups? because they have a lot in common with morality. You're not going to have a disagreement on what children can or cannot watch. Sometimes Christians are more strict with certain rules, especially raising up children. Children cannot watch this. They cannot watch this movie. They cannot play these video games. Whatever it is. Um, sheikh, um, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I heard this opinion from another sheikh. And he's like, um, the only situation when it's acceptable for you to marry people of the book is when they're small in population and, and they're women, they're not getting proper suitors from their own community. 
Yeah, I, I like that opinion. Uh, even though that is not uh, my opinion in that way, the way I frame it is that when Islam is strong, then you can marry their women. But if Islam is weak, then do not marry their women because majority of these people, uh, first of all, when we do marry them, we don't look at, are they church going? Do they actually believe in the Bible? Do they have a, a priest or pastor as their like sheikh? Uh, or do they go to the church every week? We don't even look at that. But I think nowadays it's very problematic. Majority of the times when a Muslim marries a non-Muslim girl, Christian or Jew, doesn't matter. That's my feeling. Looking at the situation, it is very problematic. And then, uh, I mean, again, this is a whole subject in itself, but you know, then the, the husband comes to me and says, well, she's decided to take the children to the church. There's nothing I can do about it. Okay, well, I mean, that's, you have to lie in the bed you make. This is life. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know what to do. So in these times, for me, it is, I can't say haram because, but I will say that it is against the Islamic spirit and it is at least very disliked under the circumstances because it, uh, it uh, takes away the future of Islam away from these kids that are, would normally be Muslims, but they, they're not going to be. And, and you know, uh, when you have kids, first people are like, oh, we love each other, we love each other, we'll, you know, it doesn't matter, we love each other. And all of a sudden, people have kids, and what happens? They become like, okay, what are, these, what are they going to be the values of these kids? And if the husband takes the children to the masjid, she decides one day, well, I'm going to take them to the church too. And from there, you get a whole set of problems and you can imagine, right? So for me, I believe very strongly that uh, it is more on the prohibitive side than on the allowed side. And so with that imam sister, he said, I appreciate that, actually. Uh, strategic eschatology or is, is yes strategic eschatology assalamu alaikum shaykh wa alaikum assalam this is our brother faraz shaykh imran student from trinidad and tobago oh, okay okay mashallah yes how are you doing alhamdulillah just in an effort to bring the discussion back to what you had originally intended it for i would just like you to um comment on ayah number 55 of surah al imran inshallah <laughs> okay, let's do that. Okay, yes. So now over here, I want to mention something important uh, since you brought this up. There is a difference between Christianity, even within the Orthodox or whatever groups of Christianity they are, and the Christianity that will be existing when Isa alayhi comes down. Those people that will follow Jesus. Because remember, there are going to be two groups of people that will be following Jesus. They'll be both following a Messiah, a true Messiah and a false Messiah. The Christians that will be following a false Messiah, that's one thing. But those people that will be following the true Messiah, that Christianity will not be in the form, probably it will not be in the form any of the forms that exist today it'll be closer to the orthodox christian but it will not be in any of the form because when isa والسلام, comes that christianity is going to accept whatever isa nabi isa والسلام, is going to teach them and so therefore this verse of the quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَقَالَ اللَّهُ and Allah said, Ya Isa, O Isa, inni mutawafika. I'm going to give you death. 
is one translation. I don't want to go into the details of this word. Wafa means to complete. And this is the word Allah uses in Quran also when we go to sleep. Okay. وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَىٰ إِنِّي مُتَوَفِّيكَ وَرَافِيكَ إِلَيَّ And I'm going to bring you up to me. I mean, I'm going to raise you. Bring you, if, uh, raise you to the heavens. إِلَيَّ وَمُطَحِّرَكَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And I will purify you from the people who did kufr of you. Now, who are the people who did kufr of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam? Is the people he was sent to, meaning the Jews. And I will make those who follow you, meaning the people that follow Isa alayhi salatu over the people who denied you. So who is that? The Jewish people. So one explanation is that the Christians will always have more power than the Jews. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Gave and this is why the Jews always need a big brother, kind of thing. The so one explanation is Allah will always give the followers of Jesus in whatever shape and forms it comes in power over those people who denied Jesus. Okay, now continuing from there, the next part is actually important. What does this ayah mean? This ayah means that there will be followers of Jesus until the day of judgment. Meaning when Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes down and Allah is addressing here in this ayah Jews and Christians. So many Jews may accept him and follow him in the end times and follow him till the day of judgment. So he will come down. But there's actually a very interesting, again, you know, not to go off topic, but there's a very interesting uh, way I want to uh, explain this. Will Isa alayhi salatu wasalam be Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki? What will he be? Okay, then let me... I will teach him Quran. Uh... No, well, I'm going to come to this. Will Hanafi mazhab completely disappear from the face of the earth? No one will follow Hanafi mazhab anymore when Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes. All the Maliki scholars will say, okay, Away with Maliki fiqh now, we're going to follow Isa. Do you see that happening? No. Do you see that all the Shafi or the Hanafi or the Madaris ulama, they're going to say, okay, Isa, we believe in you. We're good with you. We, we also let go our Quduri and our Hadaya and we also let go Hanafi fiqh. Do you see this happening? Sheikh, uh, what about uh, Imam well, al-Mahdi? When, when he comes, Imam Mahdi comes, will he, we will be following? Will he be following any particular mother, or okay. he'll be just a pure? Let's 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 answer this question, and then we'll try to answer that. Will Isa alayhissalam demand from the Hanafi that you have to follow the Hanafi Mazhab, or you have to follow me and not the Hanafi Mazhab? Will Isa alayhissalam do that to the Ummah? I don't before? think so. I don't no. think so. Right? Okay. When these Christians, they become Muslim, meaning when they accept Isa as their leader, as their prophet, will, whose mazhab are they going to follow? Whose opinions, legal opinions are they going to follow? Isa Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Right? It's generally, uh, it happens, and I say this so that it, the point is clear to you, that if somebody that is a Shia converts a Christian into Islam, that person who converts to Islam usually becomes what? Shia. If I help someone come to Islam, what version of Islam will he most likely follow? The version of Islam that I'm following. Now these people, they all come to Islam in the sense that they accept Isa wasalam, right? as Isa, as their prophet. They accept Isa as their prophet, but they're not, they're also accepting Prophet Muhammad And the Quran talks about the love of Isa wasalam, for the prophet. And the ahadith talk about his love for the prophet. But because a Christian is raised all his life, 
loving Jesus, when they will see and recognize this is Jesus, they're going to want to naturally follow him. And his fiqh and his understanding will be different from others. And he's not going to want to impede his thinking and his feeling on others. And he's not going to want to stand on the day of judgment telling Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam, yeah, I kind of took over your religion. So I just changed, I threw away Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, I threw it all in the dustbin and I said, just follow me because I'm the Nabi of Allah. He will not do that. Because of his love of the Prophet in, and, and just because it's not respectful to do. So when Isa Islam comes, there will be people who will insist, we want to follow you. Now, let me ask you this question. I, I didn't want to go here. I wanted to talk about Russia and Ukraine, and let's see if we can do that. But you opened up. When I read in Salah, I read the word of Allah. I read Quran. But Allah is going to teach Isa the Quran, the Torah, and Injil, and taught him. What are you going to do when Isa is needing the prayer, and he's reading Torah, and he's reading Injil, and he's reading the word of Allah? You may say, in response to me, we don't cancel anything and the previous books are canceled. Well, if that is the argument, then there are many ayat within Quran that are canceled and we still read them. The ayat about khamar alcohol that first came and the ayat that came last, we read them all. The ayat about doing da'wah and the ayat about jihad first and last, we read them all. So <coughs> the point being, that there will be some things different. Because Isa as mentioned twice in Quran, he's been given the knowledge of the book, of meaning Quran, of Torah, and Injil. And Allah mentions this explicitly twice in the Quran. And Allah gave him hikmah, which is wisdom. And hikmah also means the sunnah of the Prophet. But he will have access to a different set of information. So his teachings... And you'll be surprised, uh, you can look this up on the internet, my browser isn't working correctly right now, that they're actually found a small fragment. Maybe this will help align the, uh, the information. This small, they found archeologically a small fragment that says that in the end of times, when Jesus comes back, he's going to marry one of his disciples, okay? Uh, so now let me actually show this to you. Uh, see if I can find this a uh, small fragment found saying Jesus will marry his. So um, this is the fragment, and uh, let me actually show you. So some people are taking in the past, but as you can see from here, so this will marry one of his disciples. Um, uh, let's see. Anyway, if I had this in mind, I would have prepared this, but I will find it inshallah and show it at another time.
So there's a fragment. It, it was it it was probably the from from the from the al of Hazrat Shwaib alayhi salam. That was the that was the uh, woman she she'll probably marry. I I've read that somewhere. It's possible. Anyway, so the point being that when Isa alayhi salatu salam comes, it's going to be it, everything happens naturally, right? So when Isa alayhi salatu salam comes, the people that believe because he came and he killed the Antichrist. Right, so the people that came, the people that will be with Dajjal, majority of them will be finished. Now, what remains? People that are going to follow Isa. They may be Christians. They may be Jews, because there's another verse that says there will be not amongst the Christians or the Jews amongst the Ahlul Kitab, except they will believe in him before the day of judgment. So, when they come, they're going to do. They're going to follow his Sunnah. They're going to follow him. There's nothing. Now, what will be his status? He will be a prophet. He will be a prophet to them. He will be a teacher to them. He will be a rabbi to them. As the Bible mentions Jesus as a rabbi, rabbi, oh, master, tell us this. This, I'm not going to go into this discussion because that's harder to have. But what is absolutely natural, okay, like absolutely 100% natural, is that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, will have his own teachings because Allah taught him differently. And I will also mention that his teachings will be a lot tougher than the teachings of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And the reason for that, I'll explain to you, is that Isa wasallam's fiqh is going to be fiqh of ihsan. Meaning his fiqh is more like if you looked at something wrong, take out your eyes. You don't deserve to have eyes. That's his fiqh. Okay. If you thought, you know, that's his fiqh is going to be very, very difficult. And most the Hanafis or Shafis will be happy that they're Hanafi and Shafi and not following Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And because the Prophet is sent as rahmatul lil alameen, mercy to all mankind, uh, his, the fiqh under the Prophet will be easier. Because again, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes from a tradition of very difficult, because Bani Israel had made law very difficult upon themselves. So he's going to come from a tradition where law is made difficult. And he is going to combine fiqh and spirituality into one kind of a, a type of fiqh where uh, giving zakat is not enough. If, you know, uh, in Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki fiqh, if somebody says, you know, what's the minimum? He'll say zakat. Okay. But in, in, uh, if you read the sayings of Jesus very clearly, he's going to say, if somebody comes to you and says, I'm hungry. Well, if you have, you have to give it to him. That's the type of fiqh he's going to come with. So it's not going to be easy to follow him. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, but people will follow him at that level. Uh, okay, so I will make those who follow you till the day of judgment. Meaning people will follow Isa alayhi salatu wasalam till the day of judgment with his teachings as he understands them from what Allah has taught him, which is the definition of being a prophet. So, and it seems from the next part of the ayah that there will be some differences between the Muslims and the followers of Jesus. So Allah says, ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِئُكُمْ And then you will come back to me. And then Allah says, فَأَحْكُمُكُمْ and I will judge between you your differences. In regards to the things that you differed. As for those who deny you, that could be specifically amongst the Jewish people, but also amongst the Christian people. We're going to punish them with the Antichrist very severely in this world and the next and they have no helper so this is one of the ways to read this verse of the quran okay now can we go back to the original topic i had in mind which was russia and ukraine and understanding that so uh, uh brother muhammad ali do you have something to say Oh, assalamu alaikum, uh, Shaykh Ahmad Thank you very much for what you have done. 
through this uh, discuss that you bring up a lot of uh, issues, uh, which is a lot of doors actually, but no one actually opened the door of uh, our current situation right today. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Mohammed Ali from Sweden. Um, uh, yeah, I have uh, I have been with Sheikh, uh, I have been listening to Sheikh Marouf Hussein very long ago, more than twelve years, very long ago, and uh, I wish to give my comment for the current situation. Yes, please, please, please. So, so. Uh, all this uh, subject uh, that it's not direct to the to the, our current situation is important too. But I think we have to discuss this right now and maybe open this later. Uh, okay. So uh, now I see from an Islamic eschatology, and especially from the book of Sheikh Imran Hussain, the Quran, uh, the Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the Quran, we do have that Sheikh Imran Hussain have give us, give us uh, a timeline where how the Masih, al Masih Dajjal will arri arrive and rule. And he started with like the, from the Hadith, the famous Hadith, Yom Kasana and then Yom Kashahar and then Yom Jum'ah. So he took it from England, from his brilliant, mashallah, uh, explanation, he took it from England and uh, from Britain and then to US. And then we live in the last or the end of the, time like a month so we're very close to the time with like a week so from there we do understand there should be a big things a big events that change a lot of things related to the world order so the this current situation that russia versus the west is clearly uh, clarify what sheikh Imran Hassan has taught us that we can see how this world is divided into two camp very clear now we do have the the people with the faith which re represented by the east which is the russia right now and the people with the with their agenda godless agenda which is the west they everyone knows that they don't have as you mentioned you said something very beautiful you said that they uh, uh, took us from the seeking to the truth to seeking to relativity. Something about relativity you mentioned that they have based in each of us, in our mind, in our uh, culture that stop seeking the truth and just the truth is something relative, which they have now uh, based it. And even you can say they have planted already for a very long time now. So we have a lot of people now it have uh, the impact of this or they ac adopt this uh, philosophy that we don't need to look for the truth. This is our life. This is actually a philosophy called we live once. There is a lot of, of t-shirt. They have this kind of logo, we live once. So uh, for the current situation now, we can see this divide cam. And uh, what I understood, uh, as Sheikh Umrah Hassan said, they should go through something called a global order globalization order and to make this globalization occur that we're going to have one currency and we're going to have one value so they need to rid off from all these obstacles which is like in their way and the big obstacle is those who has a faith yes. this is a big 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 obstacle for the the globalization in yes. the same time, we do have the Jewish who want to rule, who want to start establish their mess messianic rule. But these people, the Jews, they are they have faith. They do have faith, but their faith is not toward Allah, but toward their Messiah uh, Dajjal. So they believe that Messiah Dajjal is like everything. He is the Messiah. He is the God Himself. So. We do have people who have faith, the Jewish, and the and the road to to establish this Messiah uh, Dajjal rule have to go through this globalization. The last week, this is the last. The as as Sheikh Imran Hussein uh, interpreted, uh, week uh, day like a week. So the day like a week, it will be somehow established in Israel, 
and they will give them the rule of like establishing new monetary system. But to make sure that this monetary system are accepted through the whole uh, humanity, they have to rid of this obstacle like Russia and China, whether to destroy them or to ban them. So they have done this for money for some of the for some countries, but they ha they have Russia now. They tried with Russia once and in the history back in the history in World War Two, and they succeed actually. They they established this called uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, and they read of uh, or they 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 said that we're gonna give uh, Russia Constantinople, but they cheat them and somehow they use them as a tool. But now we see the opposite. Now Russia goes back to their root, to their faith, spiritual faith, uh, spiritual path, which is very close to the Haq. So they are now seeking the truth. We know they have a lot of issue with the theology because I heard now a lot of discuss was about theology, Christian theology. Uh, the theology is a big subject. We should not open it now. We should focus on the current situation. So we should place ourselves. Which which camp should we support? Now the Russian, they do have uh, they do have a good plan, as I can see, and this plan was mentioned with a very famous person. His name is Alexander Dugin. I don't know if you heard about him. No. He he he, he met Sheikh Omar Hussein. Hmm. in uh, Moscow hmm. and he has a lot of good great books and one of his books is called the political uh, the, uh, the fourth political theory I think I recommend everyone to read this it's, it's very very important because this is against globalization this shows how the orthodox uh, thinker how they think in their eschatology it's called the fourth political theory hmm. and it is discuss what happening right now so they try to plan a plan to make sure that Russia is isolated 100%. So they st stressed the Ukrainian issue. So Russia now knows that when this point is uh, stressed, it will make sure that Russia will intervene, should intervene. And that will make them, that will show the whole world that Russia is against the world order, world peace and that Russia should be isolated, which makes that will make sure for them that this globalization work will go on easily to many countries because a lot of countries already accepted only that Russia can, uh, you know, as you see, when it comes to the international security, uh, they, we do have a UN and then we have a council, Security Council. They will try to isolate Russia. So if there is any new global order for the money or any other things, it will pass quickly because of this event. And Russia knows that. And I want to continue, but I will stop here because I think I talk too much. So I will leave other to interview. Okay. To no, no, inshallah, we'll, we'll, I'll try to connect what you're saying with some of the ayat of Quran, okay? Yeah, um, sure. <clears throat> so let's try to continue from here because I want to make some points and maybe I'm not going to have people's uh, because I want to continue with what I want to say also. So in order to understand the situation as it is occurring, one of the key questions to ask is, is the world, does, the, does Allah allow a uni or soul supreme power in the world? Or is it, uh, so, so in other words, uh, is the situation that there is one group on top and they're the rich and famous uh, rich people elite on the top and they're controlling everything on the bottom? Or are these conflicts that are happening between the US and between Russia and different world powers, conflict between Pakistan and India, conflicts between China and Taiwan, are these actually happening? Or they're not happening. It's all drama to, you know, create um, a situation or 
So is there, is there, is, are these events, are these conflicts really happening? Or is there an elite that's on top that's controlling everything? Do you see the, the point? Okay. So the answer to that is that both are semi-correct because we've made everything simple. So I want to start with what Quran says about the first point that I was trying to make. And that is that the Quran says, and is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَحَزَهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ So Dawood, a small group of people with Dawood, they defeated Jalut. وَقَتَلَ دَاوُدَ جَالُوتَ And Dawoodu, he killed Jalut. Okay? He killed Goliath. وَآتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكُ and those people that couldn't have even imagined that they would have power on earth, Allah gave them power on earth. He made Dawood the king. Wal hikmah, and he gave him hikmah. Yasha, and he taught him from anything he wanted. Now Allah gives a principle, a sunnah of his. If Allah would not push one people or repel one people against another people, the earth would be in complete chaos. Okay, so if there is Ya'juj and Ma'juj, then there has to be a Zulqarnain creating the wall. This is the Sunnah of Allah. Okay, so there is no such thing as a completely sole supreme power of the world. People can have that impression. But the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that there will always be one group or another group or multiple groups that will be repelling one another. And if this was not the case, the earth would be filled with fasad. Tilka ayatullahi, these are the ayat of Allah, signs of Allah, that just think that how... Uh, something came out of nowhere and became a power. And, and it repelled a great evil, for example. Okay. Tilka ayatullahi natluha alayka bil haq. We recite them to you with truth. Inna kalamin al mursaleen. You are definitely amongst the messengers. And so the point being here, on the one side, we find this that the world is not uni power. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always raise people to stop fasad from coming. From fasad to take over the world. Allah will raise somebody. If you turn your backs, Allah will replace you with other people to do his work. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always make sure that fasad does not go beyond a certain point. Okay, so this is one point I wanted to make. The second point that I wanted to make is in Sutul Qasas. And then you will have to bring these two points together to come to a uh, proper conclusion. And this is how Fir'aun works. Inna Fir'aun ala fil ard. Fir'aun was high on earth. Proud on earth. Okay. Uh, let me just clear this. Uh, okay. In the Fir'auna ala fil ard wa ja'ala ahnuha shi'an. How did he function? How did Fir'aun become high? Ja'ala ahlaha, he made its people shi'an, made them into groups. Small groups, one group here, one group here, uh, even Bani Israel divided into its 12 groups, 12 tribes. So he made into different groups so that when he breaks them up, you're white, you're black, you're this, you're that. And then he can use that to what? And so that he can have repress one of them, make one of them weak. Even to the point, even though there are more people of Bani Israel than the ruling tribe, which is the Qipti tribe, even though there are more of them, but he came into a power where 
yudhabbihuna abna'ahum, he was able to kill their sons, wa yastahyi nisa'ahum, and let go their women, innahu kana min al-mufsideen, he was amongst the people that did fasad. What was his modus operandi? His modus operandi was that he divided them into uh, different uh, groups. Okay, he divided them into different groups. So now, what do we find in these two verses of the Quran? Yeah, that's right. Even feminism versus men, you know, all of that. It's all the gifts of uh, England, you know, all of this. So Allah says, I will raise, I will not let one group, and this is the same thing Allah mentions about the churches and the synagogues, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let one group take over completely without there being, even if it is a small group of people on haq, that will repel, repel the facade. And then the way of Fir'aun is that he stands on top. So over here, we're getting two different pictures. On the one side, Allah is saying there will be, there will be no sole supreme power. On the other side, Fir'aun, he was like a supreme power. He was like a supreme power. The way Fir'aun worked, now this is the point I want to make. It's very important to understand. The way Fir'aun worked is he divided his own people into groups. So, you know, you can say uh, you have the skull and bones and you have the Freemasons and you have such and such. They're all doing the same thing, but he doesn't put, Shaitan doesn't put everybody in one group because that is his way of control. Let me explain this this way. Uh, I was at one time, maybe 20 years ago or so, studying Yasser Arafat or something about him. And I realized something in a conversation I was having that he had so many different types of police. Like in America, we have the Homeland Security, we have the FBI, we have the CIA, we have you know the local cops, we have so many of these. Why? So that if one transgresses or one rebels or one goes into rebellion, you still have the others. Like Yasser Arafat, he would have this brigade, the Al-Aqsa Brigade, and then the cops, and then his special forces, and then another special forces. Why? Because if one repelled him, then he has the others too that he can use control for his advantage. So what's going on here? Okay, What is, what is happening is, is that uh, the conflicts are real. The ideologies are real, meaning what Russia is thinking is real, what the conflict between, uh, you know, democracy versus uh, socialism, uh, the conflict between uh, uh, socialism or uh, communism, democracy, whatever is real. The conflicts are real. It's just like, uh, don't mind me saying this, but just like uh, the the conflicts between the Muslims are real. But on top, the CIA or some other hand is an agenda saying, oh, but see, he's a kafir. Oh, but see, he's a kafir. And see, he's a kafir. The conflict is real, but somebody is taking advantage of the conflict. Someone is taking advantage of the conflict. A good example of that is World War II, where the financers on both sides were the same. The financers for America, the, sign financer, the financers for Germany are the same. The same banks are financing both sides. And this is something that's, that's not even historically debatable. This is like a fact. The side that was uh, on both, the, the bankers were on opportun opportunistic. But do the banks control what people believe in? Do the banks control what the Allied forces believed in versus what the Germans believed in, or they had complete control of their thought? No. They're simply taking advantage, like Qarun. And one day, if I get a chance, I'm going to talk about this kind of like uh, this, you know, the Fir'aun versus Qarun versus Haman versus the magician and how that plays a role in our society today. But the point I'm trying to make right now is simply that there's no such thing as shaitan or anyone having complete control that doesn't exist there's no such thing as and and sometimes and i say this very is very important to me because sometimes we talk about the 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 other side 
the bankers, the Freemasons, we, or we talk about whatever elite groups, like as if they have complete control over everything. Meaning this is not, this is not true. It's just that there are people who take advantage of the situation. The, uh, it's the illusion of control that they want us to even believe in. Okay, and so we should not believe that anyone has complete control of, over everything. And uh, it's, it's kind of like the other side of the, the same coin. And I'm going to actually probably do a video on this. But the other side of the same coin is that we don't trust Allah, but we trust the Mahdi. And what I mean by that is we're waiting for the Mahdi to come and solve our problems. And we're not going to stand on our own feet. We're not going to bring ourselves to the point where we trust Allah. And that Allah then gives us the gift of the Mahdi. We're not going to do that. We're going to be in this romantic, romanticized world. And this is no different than a romanticized world in which we just give, hand over our psychological power. They have control over everything. So even the people that are believing that, okay, you know, there is a war between haq and batil. There's a war between truth and falsehood. But end, end up uh, handicap, handicapping themselves psychologically without realizing it at the deep subconscious level that when you hand over all power to shaitan, you're like, oh, all power belongs to shaitan because, you know, they control everything. And so that's not how it is. That's not how Allah made the world. The world is a free choice. And so the conflicts do exist. The conflict between America and Russia is real. But somebody else is taking advantage of that conflict. That is also real. But the people that are taking advantage of that conflict, they don't control or brainwash anybody. They're simply human beings that are taking advantage of a situation. And they happen to be bankers. And they happen to be, happen to be, happen to be, right? But they're taking advantage of real conflicts. This is very important because I, you know, because it's not, Yes, sometimes the, uh, the, 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 the Hegelian dialect is also there, that they will create a problem to create a solution. So, but even that is based upon real things. It's not like they artificially make everything up and they control everyone's mind and they control these conflicts and these conflicts are only happening because these people want. That's not how it is. It's never been that way in history. It will never be that way in history. The way it is, is that the real conflicts exist and their people and agencies and powers and cults and whatever other bankers that exist that take advantage of that for their own personal gain. So is somebody going to take this conflict of, so whenever there's a conflict, somebody's going to gain. Is somebody going to try to take advantage of this conflict for their own benefit? Of course. Of course, somebody's going to take advantage of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine for their own benefit, or the conflict between the U.S. and, and, and European Union uh, and NATO and Russia. They're going to use, they're going to try to infiltrate and put in their own uh, effect what they want out of it, what the bankers want out of it, right? Maybe they'll fund the weapons of both sides, for example, like they did in World War II. But the point is a psychological point that I think is very important. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't make anyone the supreme soul power of anything. It's because that's Allah. Number two, that Fir'aun operates by keeping the division, by keeping people in different groups. Fir'aun operates so he knows that if somebody is going to, because if you're following the way of shaitan or, or Fir'aun, you're going against your fitra. So even amongst human beings, there are those people that are going to lean towards fitra. And those that are going to be affected or by their circumstances and go against their fitra. Those people that lean towards their fitra, then that's why he has to divide them into different groups in case these people who follow fitra go in a different direction than what Fir'aun and his, you know. And this is very important because of the body of Fir'aun coming out a few, uh, about 150 years ago. And as a sign for mankind for the events to come but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, Sheikh, Sheikh, we are noticing that uh, because of this war situation, Gog, Gog and Magog are actually like the, the main agenda of their 
to bring back Jews to the Holy Land is actually fulfilled. So that that is the baseline what I understand. So 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 since that is fulfilling as a result of this war situation, the we are seeing Jews leaving Russia and Jews leaving Ukraine in abundance because of this war situation, and they are yeah. going back to Israel. So 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 how is it that they are not? I mean, I, I do agree that they are not all powerful, all mighty. They are, they are obviously they are they are creatures of, of they are like they are human beings. Obviously, they they are, but but how is it that they they still are able to make a situation and and successfully able to make two countries to to be in a conflict with each other to such an extent that they have started like a, a, a war like situation. It's simply they try to create using no, knowing this is the ideology of this group. This is the belief system of this group. How can we explore? Like, for example, take, for example, do you think it's only Muslims that are pushing the idea of Sunni and Shia conflict? Or there could be a third hand? Obviously, there are a third hand. Okay. Does the conflict actually exist, historically speaking? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, it really yes. exists. Then somebody is coming in the middle to push it and to make it happen and to make it a bigger problem than it is and to mess up our priorities of what is really an important issue versus what is to somebody else's advantage. So the conflicts are real. It's a matter of being infiltrated. It's a matter of who's taking the opportunity, who's pushing the agendas, who's putting in the money and the resources to push things in one way. But if we go a certain way, we're choosing to do that in the end of the day. So yes, this is a conflict. And I'm going to come to that. This is a conflict between, uh, and I'll mention this part to kind of like, I guess, uh, to, to, because time is running out. So I want to say this, that if there is a possibility of a cooperation between the satans, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all the satans. Then now because of this conflict, something positive could be happening, which is that this, uh, you can say conflict, will actually inflame the division and polarization between Western Europe and Eastern Europe even more. And it will cause Christians to become truer Christians. And so now in this area of Khorasan and the area outside Khorasan, within Khorasan, the Satans, the different Satans, they can build a block amongst Muslims. But now you have a situation where side by side, there is a block of East Orthodox Christians living alongside a block of Muslims. And they're also in different countries, meaning the, the, it's more than one country. And we're also different Satans, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbek, Uzbekistan, all these Satans on the one side. And then these Eastern Christian countries plus Russia with them. This can, who knows in the future, become a very natural alliance, a very natural alliance. And this is actually part of the point that people are not people are not understanding, which I, I want it to be clear, that you cannot be in alliance according to the Quran or you will be in a very devastating situation if you're in alliance with the Judeo-Christian civilization. So there, in general, the principle in Sharia is what? You can make an alliance with anyone. Make alliance with Jews, make alliance with Christians. Make, the Prophet never said, don't go to the Jewish market in Medina to buy something. He never said that. He said to the Muslims to have their own marketplace. But he never said, don't go to the Jewish. Muslims used to go to the Jewish marketplace to sell there too. In Medina, I'm talking about. The Prophet made alliances with Quraysh. The Prophet used to travel, wherever he traveled, he made alliances with all the people of whatever, uh, mostly they were uh, pagans, but he made alliances. You will not fight against us wherever he went. So in general, you're allowed to make alliances with whoever has nothing to do with your akhirah, has everything to do with our safety and our strength as an ummah in this world. And then the Quran now is telling you, but there will come a time where Judeo-Christian civilization will become one. 
And maybe I should talk a little bit more about this so that you understand. Maybe some of you are not fully there in terms of understanding what that actually means. So I'm going to maybe share with you one or two things and see how this inshallah ta'ala goes. But the Quran is clearly telling us this is the one alliance you cannot have. Islam has no problem with an alliance with India, for example, even, or with even China, for as bad as they are, right? So even with China. But with the Judeo-Christian civilization, the Quran says, better not do that. So, so now the, the question if, yes. if, 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 if that's the if that's the point, then then Turkey is uh, in, in direct. Uh, I mean, Turkey is against directly going against the Quran because Turkey is part of NATO, and and Sheikh Imran calls NATO as the military arm of that same Zionist alliance. Yes. Now, see, I'm. If I had time to actually say what I want, because I wanted to touch upon some very important points that have to do with this. Because if you understand the power structure of the, what's happening in the world with this alliance specifically. So now I want to show you because uh, this is important and I wanted to get this uh, understood. So let me just share with you um, this. Um, just so that you all begin to understand this, uh, I'm gonna sh share with you two things, okay? The largest Christian organization in America, political, Christian, political organization, political arm of Christianity in America, which is the largest organization in America. It's 70 million votes, 70 million votes. Okay. Now, this Christianity, okay, this is the, this is the website of the American, the Christian Coalition of America. Okay, this is the strongest move, uh, you could say, political organization in America. It's a Christian organization. But now let me show you something that will uh, maybe. Uh... Help you understand. Okay, so you see that? Religiously, they're one. Religiously, they are one and the same. You cannot be a true Christian. You cannot be a true evangelical Christian unless you support Israel. Now, let me show you point number two here. Is, is everyone watching this? Is everyone can see this? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, yeah, Sheikh. The Christian Coalition of America is committed to the peace and security of Israel. That means we must not allow our leaders to put America in a position of weakening Israel in the face of those who are committed to its destruction. And it continues. Okay. This is part of, let me put it this way. This is part of their aqidah. And this is their fatwa. And there are some Christians that are against this. But majority of the Christians, what Sheikh Imran Hussein calls Santa Claus Christianity, right? This is Santa Claus Christianity. Because this is not real to itself. It's not true to itself. The true Christianity would say, we are not Jews. And Jews that are true to themselves will say, we are not Christians. And we're not one civilization. This Christianity, okay, now let me show you one more thing so that this point is, I'm going to show you two more things so this point is made even more clear. Let's see if I can go to, you know how the whole world has been screaming Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden. Let me show you the real Osama bin Laden today. Okay. Uh, his name is Pastor John Hagee.
one meal shake. It's made with over 70 plant-based superfoods and nutrients. Delicious meal. Cheers! <laughs> Just water, two scoops. Please notice Israel in the church. To go into his house and to pray for that sick servant. Jesus broke the law of Moses. When With Fundrise, you can invest here, from there, or there, from here went in and prayed for the sick servant the sick servant was miraculously healed this because man, a gentile did something this man his name is john hagee if there's ever been a terrorist it's this man he is the mufti azam you know what mufti azam means the biggest mufti okay he's mufti azam of america you guys don't know about this because we're not aware of what's happening in the Christian world. Okay? This guy says, if America dies, let America die. But we cannot let Jerusalem die. We cannot let Israel die. To bless the house of Israel. Point. This church for 40 years has been doing things to bless the house of Israel. Every one of you who sit in this room are scripturally qualified to receive a miracle in your life. If only you will ask for it, God will grant it. Stand. You're in this room and you want God to do a miracle in your life in your business, in your health. Look in the background. They have the Dome of the Rock Masjid. Do you see that? Yes. In your marriage, there's some place in your life where you won't. And now. With Fundrise, you can invest here, from there, or there from here. And do you know what that promise is? That promise is you, your children, and your children's children. If you only list your vacation home on Airbnb. When the Bible speaks of inheritance, it's not talking about monetary contribution. It's talking about generational blessings, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Over here, I'll mention, so the Bible says God will bless those who bless Abraham. So. This is where this whole thing is going. You have, to, you have to bless Israel because they're the children of Abraham. Okay. And this is the new kind of like the Christians, where, where Christianity and, and, and Judaism meet is that Christians feel obligated to be nice to Jews because Jesus was a Jew. Number two, they're the children of Abraham. And because they're the children of Abraham, they have to be nice to them. They have to agree with them. They cannot say no to them at any cost because they believe America is blessed as long as we bless the children of Abraham. And the minute we stop blessing the children of Abraham, America will no longer be blessed. And this is the theology that's being thrown around in America and all the Protestant England, America. This is how they're you And who is taking advantage of this theology. Yeah, of course she's with Fox News. So this is how, this is the, uh, the I, this is what this verse is talking about, that those that make an alliance, because what's the difference between Christian and Jew now? Stand with Israel, bless all the children of Abraham. Well, to them, these white folks, they're all children of Ibrahim. And to them, these white folks, they represent uh, Jesus somehow, right? And so then they have to do whatever these white people want because they're literally representatives of God on earth to them. And their own Bible is saying these are the chosen people of God. So how can they forsake them? So they have to create a new theology, which is 
theological for the masses, but on, on, on the top of it, it's, uh, it has more to do with money and other things. But yeah, okay. So, okay. So what was my point? My point is, okay, the other thing I want to share with you is, is a, this is a side point, but it's important. And that is that how much these people are getting ready to, because of their eschatology, how much they are getting ready to uh, fight against Muslims. Okay, so I want to share this to you also. Uh, let's see if I can show this. So you're at the age now where you may start feeling certain urges to buy things at full price. But thanks to Amazon's low-priced everyday essentials, you can practice safe spending. I'm glad we had this talk. This is a sick old world. Kids, you gotta change things. Boys and girls can change the world? Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. There are two kinds of people in the world. People who love Jesus and people who don't. Read the word of the Lord. This is a whole documentary. In this portion, they specifically mention Palestine and Muslims and how they have to help Israel and how all of that. And the training little kids. You talk about Taliban. You talk about like creating terrorist camps. These are like international level terrorist camps. <laughs> Where should we be putting our focus? I'll tell you where our enemies are putting it. They're putting it on the kids. How long have you been a Christian? At five, I got saved. Yeah? Because I just wanted more of life. You go into Palestine, and they're taking their kids to camps like we take our kids to Bible camps, and they're putting hand grenades in their hands. I got Jesus. Yes, I do. I got Jesus. How about you? Anyway, I don't want to create too much of a dramatic scene, but you get the point, right? So this is on one side. This is the Christianity that's not humble, that's after power, that's after Israel, 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 no matter what. Yes, this will be uploaded, inshallah. So now we've discussed a few things, okay? We've discussed the issue of uh, the different types of Christianity. If I had time, I would show you the, 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 the covenant the prophet had with Christians. Maybe one day I'll talk about that. We talked about, is there a unipolar world or is it uh, a non-unipolar world? And we talked about how Fir'aun divides the people. Then I gave you an example. This part of the Western civilization, the Judeo-Christian civilization, that has really taken over the whole world. But this civilization that is represented by Western Europe and America, their Christianity and their alliance with Israel is on one side. So now what about uh, Putin, Putin and the Jews? So we're going to talk a little bit about that so that we kind of understand uh, what's going on. All right, so I want to, let's see if I can show you this. Okay, so now let me uh, share this with you. Which group of Jews is Putin closest to? Okay. Orthodox. Yes, I'm gonna come there in a second. So as you know, they are not the type that like the uh, reformist Jews, which is what we have in the U.S., okay? So they are Shabbat. And you have to remember, the third most spoken language in the state of Israel is Russian, because most of them Jews are from Russia. Let me also mention, the Bolshevik Revolution the Bolshevik Revolution, the Russian Revolution, was not a Bolshevik Revolution 
as more it was a Jewish revolution. You had the Christians that were the peasants, and you had the Jews that were rich, and they had and and the peasants had their king. They got rid of the king, and the Bolshevik Revolution was when a group of Jews, the majority of the people in the party were all Jews. You have to understand this history. And then these Jews, they took over Russia and created the USSR. And the Christians and the Muslims inside, who were of the majority population, were told what? Forget about your religion. Religion is the opium of the masses. Forget about religion. And so it came to a point where Jews started to leave Russia. The uh, and just like when British left places like, I'm going to give the example of Pakistan, or they left Egypt, or they left any Muslim lands, they divided it in such a way that was against uh, the natural circumstances. So, for example, uh, they divided Pakistan in such a way that other Muslim that were around like Kashmir and stuff, they were not part of Pakistan. Egypt was divided in such a way that people that are in the south of Egypt are really, they belong, they're with Sudan. Okay, you get what I'm saying. When this group, and if you listen to Putin's recent talk, which I wish I could just do a whole talk on his talk, because you would, I would say that if you listen to his talk, you would realize that there's no one more intelligent than him amongst these silly leaders. He has a good understanding of his own history, his own situation, so on and so forth. But I'm not going to go there right now. All I want to say is that the USSR was a Jewish coup of Christians, primarily. And that remained there until... And, and there's nothing more beautiful to bankers than a socialist or a communist society. Why is that? Because the bank owns everything. You don't own any property. Everything is owned by the state and the state is run by the banks. And so the bankers, they love this communistic China type style of government. They love it because everything is owned by the banks. And so when Russia was there, when Russia was there, yes, inshallah, I'm planning to, unless something goes wrong, but I'm planning to. When Russia, when, when uh, USSR was there, then as you know, the Quran says what? They will not be allowed to Jerusalem until Ya'juj and Ma'juj come and they will come from every elevated place. So from the north, they come. First from Russia, they come from the north to Israel. And then Ukraine, from Ukraine, they're going to come to Israel. And then all these European countries are going to come from the north, from the elevated place, they're going to come down, right? So that's one way to understand this verse of the Quran, one way. But the point is that this was a Jewish coup. And when it collapsed, it divided Russia in such a way that was not... They have family members in Russians, have family members in Ukraine. Ukrainians have family members in Russia. What they will not tell you is how many people in Ukraine want to be with Russia. They won't tell you that. And so this was an abnormal division. Number one. Number two. If. Mexico, which is right under the U.S., if Mexico made an alliance with Russia and they became part of another organization instead of NATO, call it, uh, call it ADO or whatever, BEDO or whatever, They're, they made some other alliance, right? And the USSR sends its military to Mexico right under the U.S., would America feel threatened? Would America say no to that? 
They will. This is exactly the problem. For Russia, it's an existential issue. First of all, it's part of Russia. Second of all, it's an existential issue as a threat. If it becomes part of NATO, then what? Then it's a threat to Russia. And this is what they were actually wanting. They were wanting from the very beginning that Russia, when it crumbles after the USSR, that after the, when the USSR, when the Soviet Union crumbled, they were thinking and hoping it would become much more decimated than it is today. They were hoping that it would never rise as a power again. But don't think that they were thinking. Think more like Shaitan knew that this place is a threat. But for some reason, for whatever Allah did, for whatever plans Allah has, Allah kept it intact. And so their design to do away with the banks and this and they were thinking everything would collapse, didn't happen. And in that, they also then carved out spaces that were unnatural. And now they're saying we want to put NATO forces in Ukraine. This is where the ultimate goal is. So that would be an existential threat to Russia. But that's not the only and this is the very key point that I wanted to sh share with you. I wanted to share with you some important points that you need to keep in mind as we proceed forward on this discussion, because we're still talking about Putin and his relationship with the Jews. I'm going to come to that in a second. Uh, but first, I want to show you a few things. Number one. This, you can't see this on the screen because it's trying to get me to get, give them subscription, but I'll show it to you from here, okay? Russia, for the first time, holds more gold than what? U.S. Yes. dollars. Keep in mind something. When was Saddam Hussein killed? When he said, we will trade in something other, we will trade the oil in something other than the dollar. When was Gaddafi killed? When he said we will do, we will, we will make a gold dinar. And here you have now a country that the international cu currency of the world, the currency everybody needs is the dollar. All of a sudden you have a country that has more gold than it has dollar. What would the bankers think of that? How do you think the bankers feel about that? Threatened. That would be a threat to the bankers. Then let me show you this. Uh, I showed this in my discussion here. Can someone in the uh, Telegram group and the other groups in WhatsApp let the people know that in the Rukia class that just tell them to come into this same space and inshallah we'll just discuss this issue for today. Somebody can just do that while I'm talking here. Uh, let me share with you this. See now how they control the world. The UK is sanctioning five Russian banks. You see, as long as you work on paper money, they have your control. The UK is sanctioning five Russian banks, such and such and such, and three oligarchs. Pretty tippid if you ask me. The oligarchs have been on the UN sanctions list since 2018. Meaning what? that how 
they have control of who rises and who falls is by control of paper money. Turkey, not long ago, had more surplus of money and today it's in debt. Before that, Malaysia had a lot of money and investors and a lot of paper money and then they put it, brought it down. As long as you have paper money, as long as you have paper money, you are in their control. What's the first thing they did with Afghanistan? Froze what? Their paper money. Now let me show you this. So they first, uh, let's see, swift access. Do you know what swift is? U.S. hesitates to pull Russia's swift access. It is the paper money you use to do international trade. The system is called swift. Okay. And then... United States opposes first trench of swift and severe costs on Russia. This is from the United, this is from the White House. February. So they took their ability or they're trying to take away Russia's ability to do international what? Trade. With what? Paper money. So I want you to understand that where the power comes from. The power comes from the money, the paper money. So now, another question when it comes to Putin before we talk about the Jewish question. One of the criterias or litmus tests you can say that we have to see who is closer to the truth and not closer to the truth is who was where during the pandemic. Who bought into the pandemic plan completely? One group of people. And then those people in the middle who went with the plan because the whole world was doing it and you had to do it anyhow, the whole world was doing it. So they went with the plan and, but never really enforced it in any real way. It's just there. And then those people who opposed it, the people that opposed it, we know that they're not part of this alliance. And many of them ended up having heart attacks or something weird. I'm saying that we can use this pandemic as a criteria of truth and falsehood. Why? Because the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Deceptions will not enter Medina. A Messiah will not enter Medina. 
And that's well, how you will know he's not the real Messiah because Isa is supposed to die in Medina and be buried in Medina. Nor a pandemic. So if there's a pandemic in Medina, that tells you what? That it's a false pandemic. So if there is a false pandemic, that means what? That Dijal at some point is going to create a false pandemic that will go into Medina. Or somebody's going to create a false pandemic that's going to go into Medina. And people in Medina are going to think there is a pandemic. Sorry, let me show you the English. Neither Messiah nor the plague will enter Medina. And so what is the situation we have? The situation we have is, let me show you. Let's see if it, this brings it up. COVID-19 cases in Saudi Arabia, Medina. So this false plague that has entered Medina, which the Prophet said it would not, those people that align themselves with a false plague are playing into the hands at the very least with who? What's the result? The connection between the plague and the jazz. And so one criteria we have is to ask that did Mr. Putin fall for or go with this false pandemic? What was his stance? This will tell us something about Putin. Now, remember, remember, there are two different things we're dealing with. I don't care about Putin. Because what is more important to me is the, is the spirit and the heart of the people as a whole. But I'm asking this question so that maybe we can have a frame of reference of how we can judge the world in today's world. One of the criteria the Prophet gave us indirectly. Yeah, and it's not what we call qatiyun nafs. It is more like hisharatun nafs. There is a, it's pointing to something you can now use to the text. The pure Islamic texts are pointing to something you can use to see who were the people who went hook, line, and sinker with Dijal and who were lukewarm and who were like, no, this is this does not make sense. And so if we look at Russia and its response to the pandemic, you will find this. So this is the first question and trying to understand. So there are two questions I'm trying to answer. The first question is, what is Putin's relationship with the Jewish people? Considering that the whole country had a large number of Jews, which is the third lar largest speaking language in Israel right now. So he had to have some relationship. It's like you cannot say the prophet was sympathetic to uh, Zionism because he had an allegiance with the Jews of Medina. You cannot do that. He had a human relationship with them. So the question is, is there a criteria within the Quran and the Sunnah that gives us a litmus test by which we can then determine, is this a human relationship he has? Or is this something more than a human relationship he has with Putin? Meaning Putin has with Israel. Okay. So now let us first deal with the question of the pandemic as a measuring stick of who is with the alliance of the deception that Dijal is going to throw at the people. So let's look at what is going on with Russia, with the pandemic.
this and many articles have talked about how Russia, even though they created a vaccine, which in a way, from the perspective of a criteria, raises a question in one's head, why would they create a vaccine? I can give a response to that, that they wanted to do that for various reasons, but it could be purely economical. But as a response, as a people, their response was at best, at best, lukewarm, lukewarm. People did not care about the pandemic really in Russia. At first, when they came out with those pictures showing people falling down in China, do you remember when these first pictures were being shown? People in the streets and just like they dropped dead because of the pandemic. And then it was spreading around the world. At that time, in the beginning, Russia gave us a, a natural reaction that was kind of like, okay, this is serious. We're going to take this seriously. Yeah, paid actors, probably. But the point being that in the end, Russia didn't care, didn't, didn't uh, you know, their response as a people was at best lukewarm. How many times Biden talked about the pandemic? the president of the United States, and how many times did Putin even mention the pandemic or Boris Yeltsin or whoever else is there? Those people that talked about the pandemic and pushed the pandemic agenda, they're in with alliance with the deception of the Jal. Those people that gave a lukewarm response and didn't talk about the pandemic there is a greater chance, I don't know anyone's heart, there's a greater chance that they may not have completely bought into the idea. I don't know. This is, if we use this as a measuring stick. Somebody can do proper research on this question. I just gave you the measuring stick and what I found. Somebody can use the same measuring stick and come back to me and say, nope, Sheikh Omar, based upon this, Hadith and the measuring stick it gives us, Putin said this and he said this and he said this and he's completely with this, uh, he's completely part of this charade. It's possible. Number two, let us look at Putin's relationship with the Jewish community. Let me pull this up from my phone, the exact place, so that it will be easier for me to show you. So on the one side, you have this. And on the other side, you have... It's, my browser is giving me issues. <coughs> uh, 
<laughs> the American Jewish Committee says Putin's comments on Jews like protocols of the elders of Zion. And over here, because I'm having a hard time with the internet, so I'll let you do your own research. But it seems the Jews that Putin is friends with are what is generally called religious Chabad Jews. Now, they come in a whole different types of spectrums, but that's the group, okay? And he has, you can say Chabad has lukewarm feelings towards Israel. They want an Israel that's religious, not an Israel that is secular. So this is where, uh, you know, depending upon how you look at it, he does have a relationship with the Jews. And he has, and actually this is the same group of people that also Trump has a relationship with, which interestingly enough, okay. And so this group of Jews, they're pretty rich, well-to-do, uh, they're not, and they're against the Reformed Jews. They're against the Reformed Jews. These are more Orthodox Jews. And the, amongst the Orthodox Jews, there's different feelings about Israel. There are those that are completely against it, and those that are completely for it, so on and so forth. You get my point. So, uh, let's see. So, should we support him, or we should just... Let it play out. Because you said that um, Jew Jewish people also support him, right? So it looks like they all are in one big party. <laughs> so Jewish people supporting him or him supporting the Jewish people, that's not the criteria. That's not the question we're asking, right? Because, uh, or, or let me rephrase that. Having a relationship with a certain group of Jews is not the question. The question is, is he part of the Zionist project? Is he politically part of the Zionist project? And the, and the simple answer is that when you look at the type of Christian he should be, and his statements about no leader of the world talks about the elders, the protocols of the elders of the Zionist, unless they have some reservation. And he's friends with the Jews that are very critical of Israel. So, yes, there's no final word on Putin. Time will tell us more. But the place he's from, the place, Russia and Orthodox uh, Eastern Christians, this area is going to play a, a very vital role in the coming events, number one in Islamic eschatology. Number two, it may happen that if things work out well, that there could be a very natural symbiotic relationship between the Satans and the Orthodox Christians in the north and the Satans in the south of that, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and then you have you know, Armenia and uh, all these other countries, Georgia, uh, Ukraine, if it's still there, Russia, a very nice relationship between these two where they can undo and Muslims will have to do a lot of work on that, but where they can undo a lot of the harm that was caused during the Ottoman Empire times by having this relationship. The Greeks, for example, the Greece people, the Greek people, they have very, a lot of resentment. So this will give now. Ukraine the leadership of Ukraine right now represents or is is in cahoots with who with with the NATO and America and so the leadership right now represents this and so if Russia takes over which I think they've already done and the people want to be part of Russia then this may open doors further more doors there's a church being opened in Russia right now every day. That's like how, because you can look at it like this, that they were in communism and completely repressed religiously. And now they're so thirsty for religion that they're like opening up a church every day. So one thing is for sure. And that is that Putin is sympathetic to his Orthodox Christian uh, citizens. He's definitely sympathetic to them. 
and he's sympathetic to their causes. He is sympathetic to their ideas, their causes, their whatever you may call it. So out of all of the great world leaders, China, you know, US, Britain, et cetera, et cetera, France, the, the person who had the, the most lukewarm response to COVID pandemic and the person who has the most relationship in terms of people because Russia was all Jew, but has not stood up for Israel the way America or any of these other countries have stood up for. Putin has shown that, but is he, is he playing a game or uh, is he genuine? I don't know. I can't say, but that doesn't matter because Putin is here today. He won't be here tomorrow. And what will be tomorrow is a different Russia tomorrow. It will be a more religious, a more orthodox Christian R Russia tomorrow. Not just Russia, but all of the, that whole region. And so Muslims have a good chance of building this relationship. And we shouldn't, based upon a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that if that we will have an alliance with them and then we'll end up fighting with them and they'll end up killing us because of this fear from this hadith that we should not move forward. Because the asuliyat come first, the principles come first. The principle is that we are supposed to have good relationships even with anybody, right? And number two, that the Orthodox Christians are the closest to us and there's specific, a specific verse in the Quran telling us that they are going to be, they, they're, they're going to be the nicest to you. They're going to be the most genuine to you. And you'll find a group of the Yehud and the Hanud, the idol worshippers, and a group of the Jews who will be severest against you. And what people don't realize, and what Pakistan and Afghanistan and all these countries, the Muslim countries, Saudi Arabia, from A to Z, what they don't realize is that they see America in front, but they don't realize it's the one and the same thing. It's the same civilization. There's no such thing as... Uh, you cannot separate America from Israel, or is and you cannot do that. You cannot separate America from Israel. There, because it's one civilization. It's the same civilization, and it's the same civilization that is representing Santa Claus. And Santa Claus, if you do further studies, directly connects with the Jal, the Antichrist, right? And uh. So that is uh, most of what I wanted to talk about today. Let me see if I missed anything out. In the meantime, I'll take one or two questions. I had a question. So they actually say like Russia being in uh, Syria and basically they're preventing what do you call Israel from taking over the Middle East. So them having influence in some part of uh, Syria and Iran is actually preventing the greater Syria to take place, right? So that's uh, true. Meaning uh, the reason Russia is there is it, partly for the same reason that Russia is in Ukraine, which is that there was a pipeline going from Syria directly to Europe from Dubai and Saudi Arabia. They were trying to undercut Russia. Look, they have done the same thing to the Rus Russians or Russian people that they did with Muslims. They have, look, they've made movies against Russia. You've seen these, right? The movies where there's always the Russian bad guy and, you know, they speak Russian and then they've made these with Muslims. And so it's this, it's, see, it's how shaitan works that they, for example, America has a lot of problems with China, but they never make movies against China. Okay. But they make movies against Muslims and Russia. Nowadays, Why? they are having the uh, agenda of like. And, and, and if I may further this, just if you, I know it's getting late, but if you don't mind, I just want to show you this verse of the Quran that will uh, shed a little bit light on this one point that I want to drive home. Uh, if you go to the Quran, and. <laughs> Uh, 
Football. Okay. Yeah. I need to. I need to. I need to get ready for one. You'll be the. You'll be the thing. You'll be the thing. You'll be the. Miss out. All right. Let's be there. Yuriduna, who? The Jews. Yuriduna, they want to extinguish the light of Allah with their mouths. What is the mouth? The media. Wallahu mutimmu nurihi, and Allah will complete his light. Ulaw kariha kafirun no matter how much the disbelievers dislike this. This is followed pre pre prior to this, Allah is mentioning Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Right? Wa is qala Isa ibn Maryam, man ans. Ya Bani Israel, inni Rasulullahi ilaykum musaddiqan lima bayna yadayya min al-tawrati wa mubashiran bi rasuli ya'ti min ba'di ismu Ahmad. I'm here to confirm whatever you got of, of the Tawrat and to tell you about a prophet that will come after his name will be Ahmad. Okay, so now those people that would have a natural alliance with al-Islam meaning the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu those people that would have a proper alliance with us. So shaitan from the very beginning is targeting them the way Muslims are targeted and then targeting the Muslims. And Russia has been part of this media uh, onslaught, character assassination, what, for the last 40, 50 years, even before Muslims were. So there's a reason shaitan has his agents speaking in this direction because they know that a Muslim Christian alliance would completely end any of their hopes of what hijacking the world through their system of riba. And so that is a crucial part that I wanted to, uh, to share. Okay. And then I think that's enough for today. I had a few other things in my notes, but it'll get too long if I go into this. I'll take like a few questions and then inshallah ta'ala we can end. Sheikh, may I? Go ahead. Sheikh, uh, uh, you know, uh, I saw a video of yours uh, saying that uh, 45 tasks to do before Mahdi. Hmm. And, um, and it was Only very, 45? mashallah. That, uh, the, uh, I, I actually added, yeah. 45 I got in the video and uh, I added uh, to about you know three four uh, you know uh, in that you mentioned about the study of uh, you know the medicine uh, you know, which one, the herbal medicine so uh, you know uh, I am you know uh, in 19 years of age I am studying you know the for my uh, medical entrance exams in India uh, so I have to get to the university uh, for that by giving that exam and qualifying in that exam so uh, i i want to uh, i want your opinion and, uh, in which uh, you know uh, degree should i pursue like uh, the yunani uh, in, in india we have these uh, different degrees right the allopathic mbbs degrees or we have the yunani uh, we have ayurvedic we have homopathic which one do you uh, recommend for me so uh, this is a very tough question. I don't have an answer. Allah Salam Sheikh, please may I clarify this? Yes. As Brother Hussain, Assalamu alaikum. Say, I will suggest that you focus more on naturopathic uh, medicine, uh, doctor of naturopathy. But there you go. Uh, I, I will start. The right I, person. I that you don't wait from, yeah, I suggest that you don't wait from US. You can do an online course from uh, US. Uh, sorry, don't wait from India. You can wait from US or any other country. That will be better. Okay. I didn't hear the name properly. Which one is it? It's a doctor of naturopathy. Doctor, doctor of naturopathy. Nat study of. And uh, very soon, inshallah, we'll be launching uh, doctor of, doctor of is uh, Islamic medicine too. So you can focus on on that. That's the future. Uh, brother, uh, can you introduce yourself to everyone here, please, properly? And so everybody knows who you are. If you have a website, if you can introduce your website. Uh, so, you know, in the future, people maybe can go to your website this way. And that way we can also benefit from that in this session. 
Assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Muhammad Nitez Malik. Uh, actually, I'm a, I'm an engineer. I first did my engineering in electronics and communication engineering. Then I'm a network and security expert, CCA 16 number 346, Cisco Cisco CCI expert. And then I'm a nutritionist, professor, scientist, and MBA entrepreneur. And I've been uh, doing lots of research on Islamic medicine. Okay, I did my naturopathy, a doctor of naturopathy from US, and currently doing some research and certain certification courses from Harvard University, okay, from cancer, uh, nutrition, and lifestyle medicines. Okay, and I have certain, uh, I have uh, my online institute, it's called Institute of Natural Health Science. Uh, very soon I'll be launching some Islamic. Uh, courses on nutrition, diet, as well as Islamic medicine. Okay, most probably I'll be tying up with lots of sheikhs and universities. Yeah, things are underway. As soon as these are launched, then I'll uh, post on, uh, in our forum. Or I'll share, share with Sheikh Umar and he'll be sharing this with you. Would you be so, doing, willing to do a YouTube video with me too, a, a conversation? Definitely, inshallah. And, okay, and believe me, I have done so much, uh, so much research into Islamic medicine. It's wonder, it's wonder. It, it's like it was there, it was neglected, but by Allah's blessing, I was just able to discover it. It's a gold mine. We were just sitting on a gold mine, and it was ignored. I have, I have studied, I have studied allopathic, uh, naturopathic, Ayurveda, uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, whatever you said. But when I came to Islamic medicine. I came to know that this is the best. And it has got answer to everything. It can cure all diseases. I'm not saying it's Allah SWT saying, it's Prophet Muhammad who said that if Allah SWT for every disease yes and cure. And it is there, you have tried and tested. It is there. Mashallah, mashallah. Okay, yeah, definitely. Will, um, please will do. I be able to get the website if I search Institute of Health Science? Or, uh, how can I get your website? Can you put, post it in uh, the chat? It's, 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 it's Institute of Natural Health Science. Uh, okay, I will uh, post it in the uh, chat or maybe in the group. Group uh, very soon. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Mthiaz, thank you very much. Welcome. And I'm very happy to be a student of Dr. Sheikh. Uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Sheikh Omar. It's my, actually, it's a blessing from Allah SWT. Pray for me, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, inshallah. Anyway, so um, any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. I hope you and your family are well and safe. I want to ask you something. Perhaps I missed it. I uh, came late. But I want to ask you regarding the Mahdi and um, the Orthodox Christians. He would probably, most probably, have an alliance with them. I would say, and uh, and I got this insight from another brother as well, and it made sense to me. <clears throat> so, the question that I have is: Is Imam Mahdi mentioned in the Quran? And if not, why is he not mentioned when he is such a big uh, has a big role? You know. So that's my question. This is a very good question. And the answer is, he's not directly mentioned. There is a verse in the Quran that I feel indirectly mentions him. But over here, I want to put Mahdi in the proper context. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah will raise in the beginning of every century a mujaddid who will renew the deen. The first person to revive the deen, remove the, the, the layers of things that are wrong, was Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Then the second person to come along in the second century who did the most work in removing false ideas from Islam against the Mu'tazilites and the Jabariyas and the Qadariyas was Abu Hassan Ashi. Like this, then the third century, uh, Sheikh Ahmad bin Hanbal, as you know, the issue that happened with him. 
And then the fifth century, there's three major personalities, Imam Ghazali, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani, Imam Baghdadi, this is the same century that uh, Abu Hassan, uh, Abu Shadli is there also. So the, it's hard to tell, uh, maybe Imam Ghazali or Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani. So every century has these people. The last century will be a, it's a normal part of the process. And it is, this is just first you would ask the question that why does Allah not say that there will be mujaddideen every century? Then, and that is also indirectly mentioned in the Quran. If you turn your backs, Allah will bring somebody else. The word of Islam will continue. So in that process, starting with Mujad al-Afsani, then Shaulila Muhaddas Delvi, then Sheikh Ahmed, then uh, Sheikh al-Hind, uh, Mahmoud al-Hassan, then after that, uh, maybe Iqbal, and then now last and finally, who will in some ways be the, 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 the full mujaddid in a sense that he will do all the things that the previous ones did plus his role. And uh, so that is one aspect to it. So it's not like some, it's like this idea of the Mahdi that, you know, that he is going to come as kind of like a demigod and he's going to have supernatural powers. No, it's not like this. It's simply very simple. If you know somebody's from the family of the prophet, there will be less chances of conflict. I'm not going to disagree with this scholar or not. He's not a scholar, but a person who knows the deen. And he's also from the family. I have a reason or we all have a reason. In, in fact, let me also mention in the Shafi fiqh, in the Shafi fiqh, the people from the family, and Imam Shafi was part of the family of the prophet. In the Shafi, in the Shafi fiqh, the precedence is given to the family of the Prophet in terms of ruling. One natural reason for that is what? Is that, you know, if it's Sheikh Omar, well, anyone can disagree with Sheikh Omar. But if the person sitting here, you say to him, he's from the family of the Prophet, well, you're going to think twice. Okay, even if I disagree with him, maybe I should keep my mouth shut. So, but also why from the family of the Prophet? The Prophet was sent with a mission, which is to bring Islam to the world. This was his mission. And this mission is until date, until this date it is incomplete. He came with the mission of Al-Islam. This Deen Al-Haq has to be established. In his lifetime, he established it in the Arabian Peninsula. But the rest of the world remained. And the Arabs have something in their culture which is that if the father can't do it, then one of the sons can. So somebody from the family of the prophet has to witness on behalf of the prophet in a way that yes, I bear witness the deen of Muhammad has now been globalized, globally established. So this process, you can say, Mahdi will be part of this process. And you know, in the durood we send to the Prophet Muhammad. there is a type of indirect, you can say, hishara, that just like there were prophets from the progeny of Ibrahim, but there will be uh, people from the al of the Prophet, meaning the ummah of Prophet Muhammad, but specifically from the family of the Prophet, there will be people coming time to time who will be blessed. And after all, why not? when we're sending so much durud to the Prophet, to him and his family, to his progeny, just like, because that's the biggest, you know, individually, the biggest thing in front of Allah is what? I'm Shaheed. I died in the cause of Allah. But one with that is that Allah, I'm here, and Allah, this is my son, Ismail and Ishaq. And Allah, this is my grandson and all the Prophets behind Ishaq. And Allah, this is my grandson, Muhammad, that I prayed for. I present this to you. So Muhammad وسلم, will also, on the Day of Judgment, just like Ibrahim, this is what the durud is. He will present to Allah, Allah, this is my family. This is Hassan. This is Hussein. This is their progeny. And this is what they did. This is what they did. This is what they did. And finally, one will be 
from the lineage of Hassan is what most often is said. Just one big one, the Mahdi will come from him and Allah knows best. And same, so what that dua of the durood is now reflected in here indirectly, okay? So uh, this is now a natural sequence. The mujaddidin are coming. They're not mentioned in Quran. But Quran gives you an indirect hint to it. Uh, and then there is one verse of the Quran that's also indirect, but is interesting. That is an indirect uh, discussion in this context of the Judeo-Christian civilization that we were talking about. And since you mentioned it, I'll mention it to you and show it to you and show you how strange this is, uh, this particular verse of the Quran, as if it is talking about the Mahdi, but it is not Qatai. It's not saying it's talking about the Mahdi. It is not definite. It is, there is a level of assumption and a le level of interpretation that we that is uh, required here. And that is this verse here. In talking about the Jews and the Christians, let me, oh, the same verse that I mentioned. This verse. The very next verse is Who can be more wrong than the one who prevents people from the masjid of Allah? And this is what will happen with the Mahdi. The army will be sent towards Mecca to prevent him from doing his work in the Kaaba. And before that, he will be in Medina. In the perhaps, I'm assuming if you go to Medina for refuge, you're going to the Masjid of the Prophet. That's an assumption on my part. But then he goes to Makkah. And so Allah says, Who is more wrong than the person who prevents people from the Masjid of Allah? When Allah's name is mentioned in it, and Sa'afi Kharabiha. And more than that, he works for its destruction, meaning the destruction of the Kaaba, which is what that army of the Romans will come for. <inaudible> they better not enter except in fear because something terrible might happen. They might sink into the ground. Okay. <inaudible> and it will happen because for them is humiliation in this world. And for them is a punishment in the hereafter. And then referring as if to the Christians, as if referring to the Christians, Allah says, And for Allah is the East and the West. Allah doesn't need a Qibla, but Allah is going to protect it. From who? And they say Allah has adapted a son. When he has decided something, he only says be and it is. So in here, this is not qatiyun nas, this is not definite. Okay, but there is isharatun nas is there. The hishara that what is this talking about uh, Jews and Christians and Christians and coming to the Masjid of Allah and destruction of a Masjid of Allah, meaning the Kaaba, and referring to the Qibla to make sure that the Masjid is understood as the Kaaba. What is this referring to? A ta'wil could be made. This is being referred to the, uh, of the Mahdi being in the Masjid and people trying to prevent him from being in the Masjid, which operations for that have already begun, especially with this covid uh, situation okay so uh, I hope this uh, answers the question that the brother had about why Mahdi is not mentioned in Quran he's not mentioned in Quran because he's indirectly you can say mentioned in different uh, places of the Quran like I mentioned um, and so there he's part of the Mujaddideen of Islam He's part of the the rood. He's the response. He's the one of the responses to the rood of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And 
like this portion of the Quran that I showed you is an indirect indication of something uh, like that, like him. So I hope this answered this question, inshallah ta'ala. Yes, thank you. I wanted to uh, also, the reason that I brought, brought up uh, his uh, alliance with the Orthodox Christians, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, as you know, the army that will, that will come to help the Mahdi will come from Khorasan and it is very likely and may become necessary that this army from Khorasan will be in touch with its Christians uh, in the north and therefore will already have an alliance with them and may work out uh, some sort of alliance with the Mahdi. Anything else? Shaykh, as uh, regarding this uh, army from Khorasan, uh, I think it's not possible to send an army uh, from Khorasan until and unless a Khilafah is established in this particular area. So I believe before that happened, a Khilafah will be established in, in the Pakistan, Bangladesh, or subcontinental Hind, and then so that they can easily send the army. No, otherwise, if you have It can also be Uzbekistan, you know, could be Tajikistan, but yes, uh, I, I feel, this is what I feel. Okay, that when the nation states fall, people have no source of unity at that point. Because right now, what unites us? The government, the secular system. That's what keeps us together. If the system falls, and the system will fall for two reasons, which I can share with you later. But if the system falls and the system is going to fall, what will be the cohesive force to gather the people together? There will be no cohesive force. And there has never been any other cohesive force other than religion. That's the only cohesive force that will bring people from, right, from all parts of the world to become a force for protection and security. So when the nation states fall, then at that time, even if you're an atheist, you will identify with a Christian if that is your heritage, right? And even if you're a Muslim atheist, you'll say, I'm Muslim because that's the group that's protecting you. And at that time, it's not a secular society. It will be a religious. We will go back to religion. In other words, the postmodern world will be a very uh, strange world, but will also be a very religious world. And uh, the, um, the cohesion religion gives uh not even governments can give so that is uh my answer in terms of uh what you asked inshallah um i didn't you see that hold on one second imran khan Imran Khan and Ardugan both, to me, they're deceptions. And like I said, the criteria to know a deception is to see who gave what response to the pandemic. And you can see what the government of Pakistan, how it treated the pandemic. And uh, uh, I'll just leave it at that. I have great suspicions on both Ardugan. I don't trust Ardugan and I don't trust Imran Khan. But he was an expert at, and people have become better and better experts at manipulating people. And Imran Khan, very interestingly, like Ardugan, for the first time in this secular modern world, they were, and just like Trump, by the way, this is a trend and we should know this. Leaders becoming leaders by claiming loyalty to a religion. Trump came as a, as a, as a, or as a, as a, the event, these same Christian coalition people I talk, they're the ones who voted Trump in. And Imran Khan, Riyasat de Medina, 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 I'll bring Iyak and Abu Iyak and Istain. Everybody knows the whole, you know, this is fooling people using religion. And that's what uh, Dijal will become an expert at. How religion can be used specifically, uh, you know, 
the pretending to be the Messiah. Uh, and so Ardugan also, uh, he is just an expert at uh, trying to look like he, they place themselves in a perfect position to because if a person is serious about religion, okay, then they have to, you know, know the tree by its fruits. And I don't see any fruits. I see Ardugan taking Muslims and making them into political leaders, uh, political prisoners. Okay, more and more people uh, under the idea that they're following our, uh, this uh, Fatih Gulan or they're following the teachings of Sayyid Nursi. You know, you have Imran Khan talking about Rumi and these spiritual matters. And, uh, but in practice, it's zero. Turkey will be taken over. And maybe this conflict that we're seeing before us today might be the catalyst for that. And I'm not sure uh, if it will be that uh, the, which side is going to take over Turkey and then how this will all work. I haven't figured that out. But I can say that definitely this is a major event that has happened in the region. It has shaken the world. Uh, you know, uh, people have lost hundreds and thousands of dollars overnight uh, in the stock market and whatever. Uh, and uh, it's shaken the world to, to its core financially. And the, the bankers want people to feel uh, shaken to the core. And so this event may become a catalyst for the events that will happen in Turkey when Turkey is taken over. And, uh, but it won't be uh, a one-time. Uh, could Ardugan be a Sufiani? Uh, inshallah, I will uh, comment on that. I'm not sure yet on, on that. But uh, this is, you know, it used to be Saudi Arabia. They used to rise the, the, the Salafi brothers in Saudi Arabia as like the ideal Islam. And then they had Turkey. They had now have Turkey for the Sufis. Okay. And then they have uh, Imran Khan also there. Um, but Imran Khan still drinks alcohol, you know, and just uh, the whole un Islamic lifestyle is there. It's just words. That's all it is. Sheikh, can I ask you something? Yeah, if anybody can give me an analysis of Putin's speech, because I think it was a great speech. And I've never seen a world leader give such a good speech before. And if somebody wants to give me an analysis, uh, I would be very happy to see that, definitely. Okay. I don't have an analysis of that, but um, the question that I wanted to no, ask... No, somebody wrote in the chat if I want one. So I was like, oh, yes, okay. give it to me. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, so the question I have is that... Um, what are your thoughts on Orthodox Christians, um, particularly in Africa? So two things that I will mention. Number one, you know the Hadith of Banu Ishaq, and a lot of us have tied that with Khorasan, which of course makes sense. But I want us not to forget, there's many Banu Ishaq in Africa. Many of these Israelites, they went to Africa. And they're part of the African society. And many of them were Jews and they became Muslim. And that's one thing to keep in mind. Africa might be one of the secret hidden weapons of the Ummah. Number two, that uh, same thing with uh, the Christians in Africa, for example, where they've lived side by side with Muslims without any issues for centuries. And uh, even though uh, in recent times, because of the situation, the world has created, you know, the, the, the conflict between the, the Christians and Muslims was never there until the modern times. But now, like if you look at Ethiopia, if you look at Kenya, or look at, uh, in these countries, a lot of them have a good relationship. 
Could you repeat? Many Christians and Muslims have a good relationship in African countries uh, where they, they, you know, like Nigeria has many Christians, many Muslims, they get along. Same thing with other countries like Ethiopia, for example, where Christians and Muslims get along. So there are other places that could be, and they're more orthodox, they're a different type of, uh, they're a different type of Christian, even in the Arab world. Like, for example, the Palestinian Christians, they have a very good relationship. They're closer to the Muslims than they are to the Jews. And they fight with the Muslims, not with the Jews. So this can be true at many different levels. But when you're looking at it at civilizationally in the larger geopolitical context, then, you know, this whole block is very, is, is very, very significant. But there are places in Africa uh, where uh, Muslims and Christians get along just fine. Is it okay? Yeah, you can move back to Pakistan. But what I want everyone to keep in mind is that when the global system falls, it's not going to matter where you are unless you're prepared. So the issue is not where, it's preparation. Okay, and I'll end with this verse of the Quran, and uh, and then you can uh, think about it. And this verse of the Quran is repeated, uh, or I mean, this point is repeated in the Quran more than once. But I'm I'm going to show you the ayah that I like uh, in this regard. Uh, let me show that to you because it's very very pointed, very very clear. And that is this verse of Sutul Isra, where Allah says, min nahnu There will be no city except we will destroy it. Qabla yawm al qiyamah, before the day of judgment. So, and before the day of judgment will come a time where there will be no city except it will be destroyed. Or, aw, or, mu'adhibuha, adhaban shadida. Or, with some exception, there will be some cities that will be spared. But they will be the exception. The majority will be destroyed. This is in the book that is written. Now, how can this happen? And let me bring this together with another part of the Quran that I'm going to create an entire video on and just mention, just point it out over here uh, very quickly. Okay, let me just talk about this and then I'll talk about this uh, here. Okay, so this is the verse, but let me just talk about this. The whole, the immin qariyatin nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawm al qiyamah. Now, this is the question we have to ask. Allah says, there will be no city except we will destroy it before the day of judgment. Does this mean each city will be destroyed one at different times? Eventually, all the cities of the world will be destroyed after one, one year, Chicago is destroyed. And the next year, uh, you know, Tokyo is destroyed. And the next year, Islamabad is destroyed. Is that what it's referring to? Or is it saying that at all, at one time, all the cities of the world will be destroyed or severely punished? What is it talking about? Is it talking about over time or is it talking about spontaneous? In min there will be no city. Illa nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawm al The ayah seems to indicate it is talking about a certain point in history before the day of judgment that where there will be no city except it will be destroyed. Now, how can that happen? If there's a globalized world, they belong to the same economic system, the same paper money. And riba wa Allah destroys riba. So they keep falling into this trap where riba gets destroyed. Then they change it from 
you know, currency backed by gold. Then it got destroyed. Then they made it into currency not backed by gold. Then they got destroyed and then they just simply started printing. Then they got destroyed. They said, okay, we'll go into digital. So each time it gets destroyed, they finally come to a point they don't know what to do. And the whole system falls. So the thing that's tying like a web, the whole world is the economic system and the global trading and the trade and the, uh, the cities are all locked in with one another. Your bananas coming from 3000 miles away, et cetera, et cetera, right? Your gas coming from far away. So when that system shuts down, all the cities fall apart. They, cities have no bananas, okay? The cities have no gas. The cities are useless. They will be completely destroyed. People are going to raid into each other's houses. They're going to raid into each other's supermarkets. They're going to take everything and break everything and try to survive in whatever means that they can at that time. And it will be chaos. And it is possible just a few people will survive from each of these places. The world population may be severely reduced. I don't know, but it seems that way from what the prophet said. And so what will, what will cause all the cities if it is happening at once? Let me show you another verse of the Quran that I've discussed, but I'm discussing this from a perspective today that I haven't talked about before, which is, will it be spontaneous or will it be uh, gradual? So we look at another verse of the Quran, which I'll share with you from this perspective. Let's see if I can. Uh, can you repeat that? That is this verse. Very quickly, I, I know I've done videos on this verse um, more than once, so but I'm going to make the point from the perspective of the timing. The example of life of this world is in like the water that we sent down from the sky and it got mixed with the herbage and the grass and the greenery of the earth. So people ate from it and the animals, they ate from it. This has been the system of the world until the, uh, until the industrial revolution, which is what? Agricultural society. Society is based upon agriculture. Economy is based upon agriculture. Hatta until. Hatta until. Until the earth brings out its ornaments. So it brings out its ornaments. And now the iron and ore and, and the uranium and copper and all those things come out. You make planes with it. You make everything with it. And you make the earth beautiful. What happens as a result? And the people who were in control thought that they have control of the world. They had the suspicion. They had the thought. They had the fanciful thinking. They are in complete control now. At that moment, our command will come. In the day or the night, meaning part of the world will be day, Part of the world will be night. We'll make it as if it was completely everything was taken away. Like you harvest a crop and take everything away like that. As if there was no yesterday. It will happen in one day. One side of the world day, one side of the world dark. This is how we clarify our verses for people who will think. And so the English translation, the likeness of the present life in this, in, the, in this is like water we send down from the sky is absorbed by the plants of the earth from which people and animals eat. Phase one, until coming to phase in the final phase of humanity, when the earth puts on its fine appearance, 
This is a very bad translation. means until the earth brings out its ornaments and is beautified. That part is fine. And its inhabitants think that we have mastered it. Our command descends upon them by day or by night, meaning the same day, and we turn it into a stubble. Now, let me just see who did this translation. Yeah, this is not a good translation. Let's try. Sheikh Khattab, uh, the English Khattab is good. Let's try Sahih uh, International since they're well known. Yeah, I like Khattab too, I think. Um, Taken on its adornments, again, is very bad translation. Let's try this brother that you mentioned, Khattab. Nope, they all did a very bad job. On this particular part, hatta until ida when ahada means to take or bring out out the earth zohrufuha its ornaments. Okay, in fact, there's a surah called Surah Zohruf, which means ornaments. Wazuyinat and the earth becomes beautiful. Wadan ahluha anahum qadiruna alayha and the people who are in charge think they have complete control of it. Ataha amruna alayna an nahara. Our command comes to them in the daytime. Or, you know, the thing is when you're translating. And if this is not in your mind, how it's all interconnected, then you're only translating the ayah, and then sometimes you may miss something. So we mow it down. I like that. That part I do like. We mow it down as if it never flourished yesterday. That is actually a very nice way of saying this. This is how we make our signs clear for people who reflect. So it seems... That it will happen. All, 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 of, all the cities shut down. Everything shut down. Now when there's a war in Ukraine, the whole economy of everyone is down. Right? The uh, State everyone. emergency has been sanctioned. So there you go. So that's what I wanted to discuss. So to summarize, these are the things and the points that I discussed. Uh, some of these, let me just say it so that you can just kind of like uh, the two types of Christians in the Quran, the Quran and the Jewish Christian Alliance, non-Zionist Jews also have a chance, the prophet and different types of Christianity, the Quran and unipolar world or unipower world versus Quran in a multi-power, so two-dimensional versus three-dimensional. It's not that someone's in control of everything. But rather, there are those that are opportunists that take advantage of real situations happening really between people, like the bankers would. So, you know, the, the debate between the Hegelian dialectic versus uh, multiple uh, players. So he Hegelian dialectic makes it more look like there's only one player playing everyone. That's not completely true, nor is it true that it's just multiple players actually acting out their differences with one another. It's actually the bankers taking advantage of op real opportunities amongst real uh, conflicts between people. Okay. And of course, I talked about the bankers. So I wrote here, bankers take sides or fund both. Numi bankers don't take sides. They fund both sides. They don't say, oh, we're going to be on the side of uh, America and not on the side of Hitler. And so we're not going to give Hitler money. No, they're going to give them money so they can make money. Uh, so yeah, I talked about the difference between Eastern Europe versus, versus Western Europe, especially how Eastern Europe will, after this conflict, probably become more Eastern. 
And after this conflict, Western Europe will become more Western uh, in terms of their alliance. Secular versus uh, secular religion versus civilizational religious culture order. Um, yeah, I talked about that. Russia and the Muslim world, I talked that, about that. So here, I wanted to say this, is that you know, the Muslim countries should understand that it is in their interest, it is in the, it is in the Quranic, uh, you can say, uh, directive of the Quran, that they face not towards uh, the Judeo-Christian alliance, but they make the alliance in, with the ones that are in opposition to that. And that is those, especially the, the largest is those Christian blocs that, uh, that are near Russia and around Russia, Georgia, Armenia, and the Greeks, and so on and so forth. Uh, Chabad and Putin, still somebody needs to investigate more precisely. I would like somebody to investigate on that. And then Jill Christians and their relationship with Israel. I talked about that. The world stage today, I'm not going to talk about that right now. The place of Christian eschatology and Christian YouTube speakers and Quranic analysis. Oh, okay. I did want to say something about that. It is good to see what Christians are saying. But please keep in mind, it is this Christian version that of, of, of things that, uh, that Shaitan is using. And I'll give you one example of this. Okay, that he's going to also, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Isa will come, come with Torah and Injil, he's going to show them the real Torah and the real Injil. So this is how things were actually supposed to be. When you have a Torah and Injil not being looked at through the lens of Quran, you will get a very different interpretation of the same text that if you're looking at it from the lens of Quran versus without the lens of Quran. Okay, so you can take from Christian speakers or people that talk about eschatology. Yes, good. They may be good Christians. They may even be Orthodox Christians. But remember that Jesus, the Messiah, the false Messiah, is going to come back as Jesus. And he's also going to quote the Bible. And he's also going to use the Bible to mislead the people. Whereas Isa will come with the real stuff. He's going to come with the fake stuff. And so what I'm trying to say is that don't take everything hook, line, and sinker. Okay? The, what the Bible says has to be filtered through Quran and then even sometimes through Hadith. And let me give you one example, okay? To kind of like show you what, I, uh, what, what could be the danger in that, okay? Okay. Uh, Now, as you know, this is the number six in Hebrew. I don't know if you, uh, I think I did a video on that, but I'll show it very quickly. Uh, number six in Okay, so you see that? Now, what's, what's the lesson here? Now, I want you to also notice that this monster drink has a cross on it. The monster drink has a cross on it. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can show you the monster drink. If you look here. I guess, hold on. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can. No. So if you look at the monster drink,
You'll see the, cro the cross on the O. Do you see that? Yes. So what is it? What is he? So on the six 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 is the sign of Satan, and then you have a cross. The point being is that it's a double trick. It tries to tell you there's Satanism, and the opposite of Satanism is is the cross. And of course, that's a lie. The opposite of six 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 is not the cross, right? So you have to be careful that when you're going into things like 666 and the mark of the beast and a lot of these things, shaitan is actually using that to point to the, to make the point that Christianity is the real religion. If you believe in the 666 over the numbers given in Quran, for example, the number 19, <coughs> and you're completely, uh, listening to these Christian channels and they're giving you Christian numerology and it may be, it may not be. And, you know, we have to be careful even going in extremes. I'll give you an example. Uh, somebody said something about the number 33 being a Satanist or something to do with the, um, the Freemasons or um, yeah. So, or Freemasons have 33 degrees or something like this. Well, subhanAllah is 33 times. You know, so it's it's not it's not like it's not like Quran, okay? It's not like Quran. If it is, it is. If it isn't, it isn't. It's not a big deal. Like take everything according to their priorities, okay? Take everything according to the priorities. So the priority is Quran, and then okay, six 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 is interesting, but or thirty three or whatever other occult numbers we have. The whole gematria. A lot of people are into it. That's fine. But keep in mind, it, it, there is a lot of deception in this because Gematria is based upon a book that has been altered to some degree. Some aspects have been altered. So the results have been altered. The numbers have been altered. So don't uh, you know, uh, fall for this hook, line, and sinker. You have to be careful is all I'm saying. It's in good information. It's useful information. Some of the information collaborates with our Quranic information. Yes. I'll give you an example. Uh, there, you know, one of the signs of the day of judgment in the Bible is that uh, that knowledge will be spread. Er everyone will be able to read and write. It's in some place of the Bible. Okay, and our tradition says something like uh, people will be jahil. So it'll be both are true. Knowledge is everywhere, but people are jahil. So it, sometimes it works out. And sometimes you have to be careful. It's not going to work out. And the people that are going to go too much into the biblical eschatology without knowing the Islamic eschatology, they fall into the trap that then if things happen according to the eschatology they studied, now they're falling for the trap of the Jal. Okay. So just keep things in a balance is, is, is what uh, my point is. I'll take one or two last questions, and then I think I've really had it for today. Um, I think everybody. But Sheikh, I, I I have one question. Like uh, there yeah. there is a hadith where uh, when Hazrat Isa will come back, he will kill the, uh, I mean, kill the pigs, and and then break broke the cross and things like that so 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 is it like do, do we have some tafsir on it or is it like literal or what's what's actually the meaning of that hadith so the asuls are as follows number one question is what are the principles by we know something is metaphorical and what are the principles by which we know something is physical so let me give you some of those okay and then I will ask you to tell me if you think it is physical or actual. Number one principle of something being metaphorical is that you could make a general statement, but not specifics. I'll give you an example. Let's say Sultan al Kahaf said that Zul Qarnain built a wall, but gave no specifics. He didn't say, bring me iron blocks and put copper over it. If the Quran said Zul Qarnain built a wall, 
then it could be metaphorical or it could be physical. But once you start describing and giving details to something physical as physical, then it is not preferred to give it a metaphorical uh, interpretation as the primary interpretation. It may still have a metaphorical interpretation. If there is something that uh, is against khaliful ma'na, meaning, in fact, that is not the case. So, for example, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we would found, we will find a mountain of gold. Is there such a thing as a mountain of gold in real life? There is mountains with gold in it. But there's no uh, mountain of gold. It doesn't exist. So now you can, you're allowed now, because the re, in reality, such a thing does not exist. You're now allowed to give a metaphorical interpretation. It may happen in real. It may. But what are you allowed? The question primarily for a scholar is, how do I do interpretation, right? And how do I look at the text, the Quran and the Sunnah? How do I look at the text? And the question is, what am I allowed to do with the text and what am I not allowed to do with the text? What does the text allow? What are the rules of engagement with the text? The Prophet says the Jal will be on a donkey with long ears, right? 70. If we know, in fact, there's no donkey at the time of the Prophet that has an ear that big, can we give it a metaphorical interpretation? The answer is yes. Another way of knowing that it's metaphorical is if the Prophet describes the same phenomenon in different ways, then you know that it's not that one thing, but it's metaphorical because it's being described. Like I'll give you an example. The prophet said about the donkey, the travel, he will travel with the donkey. The prophet also said the jal will hop from city to city. Right? So describe one way, then describe another way. If, if there's a hadith that describes a horse, if it's just a horse, you, can, you may be allowed to give it a metaphorical interpretation. But if it says a horse with a uh, white... Uh, knows. Now it's become more specific. Okay, so these are the rules by which you can uh, um, uh, in engage uh, the idea if it is metaphorical or physical. There are other rules too. I just don't remember them offhand, and I don't. I think remember the question right now, but I think it had something to do with. Um, so, so I was saying that. Um... The hadith use the word like he will break oh, the, the cross. cross. Yes. So now, because it mentions only the cross, it does not give specifics of a cross. It could be real. It could be metaphorical. It could be that there is a flag with a big cross on it, and he'll. Uh, but most likely, when Isa is talking about it, and he's talking about the cross, he will break the cross. He's most likely talking about metaphorical why because the cross there's no one cross or you, you it's it's unlikely he's going to ask uh he may he may he may say okay everybody who believes in me now all the christians who became muslim basically who believe in me all of you have to in order to give me bayah or follow me you have to break your cross so he'll break the cross he may do that it may be a physical phenomenon or it may be that uh, he's talking about it metaphorically. Now, based upon the rules of engagement of the text, it can go both ways, but the primary, the primary will be, the primary will be metaphorical. Why? Because it's not fil waqiyar, meaning it doesn't happen in, in, in real life that there's something called breaking the cross per se, okay? So he's gonna break the cross ideologically, and then he may also break the cross uh, physically by telling the people to break your crosses. He will kill the pigs. Uh, that may have a metaphorical interpretation. If something specific is not given, right, uh, then you can, you're allowed to give it a metaphorical interpretation, especially, especially if it has to do with something in the future that you have to now describe that's not easy to describe without and this is one of the great things about the prophet he said things without trying to confuse people you know so it wasn't it shouldn't be too confusing to the people that are hearing it 
and conveying it, and it shouldn't be too confusing to the people receiving it. Uh, Russia has what? I, let me see. Well, because the prophet mentioned a specific uh, place, the Euphrates, so that is the place where we would be concerned with this. Okay, everyone, thank you very much. I hope this was at least uh, productive to some degree for all of you. And thank you for staying and sitting and talking. And uh, I hope that at least what I wanted was certain basic questions to be answered, like who has power? Is it unipolar power? Uh, questions of interpretation. What does Quran say about the different types of Christianity? Like basic questions. I want to clear those so that when we're engaging with one another, and I want this to be very, very clear, please. I want to really leave this as the last point. In our discussions, in the chat rooms, in fact, I'm going to do a special video on this, but it is extremely important not to argue. All the baraka of anything goes away when you argue. It doesn't matter who is right, who is wrong. The baraka of the, of the space goes away. The one thing the sahaba were not allowed to do in front of the prophet was to argue. And every single time the companions of the prophet argued, it always had a devastating consequence. I'll tell you. For example, when the prophet was about to tell them when is Laylatul Qadr, what prevented it? People arguing. The Prophet ﷺ was going to give some last, write down some last advice before his passing away, but some companions started to argue. The Prophet didn't write it down. Right? The Prophet's harshest words in the Hadith literature are about when people argued. Like when people argued, that was the one thing you were not allowed to do. Okay? You could not do in his majlis. You had to just stay silent or say something good or positive or say it directly to the prophet, but not to each other. You are not allowed to argue. There is nothing good that will ever come out of argument for the most part. And you're definitely not going to convince of anyone of anything in a chat room. We have to create spaces like this where we can have maybe more clear discussions. But the chat room is there for you people to find people in your local places where you have like-minded people so you can connect with them, create your own groups, and do work in the real world, number one. Number two, you can share opinion and thoughts. Somebody can tell me something I can benefit from. I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to agree with 100%. I may agree with 10%. I may offer a counter position that I think this way. And I understand you think this way, but I think this way. And, but if you get down to the point of arguing, even like if you remember when the whole flat earth thing happened and we started to argue and I started to argue with the brother, it doesn't end well, right? It's a trap of shaitan, whether it's me, whether it's you, whether it's anybody, just try not to do it, okay? Uh, it was not allowed in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you will destroy the army of the Mahdi if every left, right, and center person you disagree with, you're disagreeing with them. Okay. This is not the time to, you know, we come on the chat groups to learn how we can fulfill our responsibilities of learning how to live off the grid, how we can find people locally, how we can grow in terms of our knowledge and understanding of what may be happening uh, to connect spiritually, all that. But arguing will arguing is like putting the most bitter thing inside honey. So even if you have the best platform, the best platform, the best, you know, uh, whatever, it will get destroyed because of argumentation. Argumentation for the people that take me as a teacher or whatever at any level, you're not allowed to argue, period. If somebody says something against me, Sheikh Imran Hussein, you can offer a counter opinion, but do not argue. And then say, I'm not going to argue. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, basically, that's basically it.
so much for answering that. Is it possible that you could just go over the third point, which was um, that uh, that he will abolish jizya? Like, how can a how can uh, Sharia be be um, be disbanded after it's already written in the Quran? Or is is this going to be like a miracle of Isa Isa ibn Maryam that that the whole of the people will, will believe in La Ilaha illallah and thus the the jizya itself is is um, Disimplemented. So jizya is for Ahlul Kitab. Jizya is for Ahlul Kitab. What will happen to the Ahlul Kitab? The Ya'juj and Ma'juj that are going to go to Israel, what will happen to them? A prophet, killed by Allah. So, see, the, the, the Sunnah of Allah is to destroy the people in front of the Prophet. Right? Like Yunus left his position and they didn't get destroyed. So, Nu is there, they get destroyed. Luth is there, they get destroyed. Now, Isa came to his people and he got lifted. But he still has to complete the task. So part of Ahlul Kitab finished. What remains? Those that are going to follow Isa. So what will happen to the jizya? There will be no jizya. Because jizya is for Ahlul Kitab. Oh, I don't see it like that. Eh? Like it's going to be like a merge event between Christianity and Islam, and that's the only one that will remain is the two. So, it may also be an indication that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will bring his own understanding and implement his understanding. And uh, it may have different ways of interpretation. <coughs> so, we will see when it happens, but in, in principle, uh, there may be a few Christians still left, uh, you know, that are kind of like not at the group that got destroyed, but they're not with Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, but they claim to be Christians. And maybe Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will declare you're not Christians if you're not with me. Or I don't know, you know, what will happen. We'll see. But the, the, the main point I was trying to say is I gave two reasons. that Because we don't know what will happen in the future. So there's an interpretation. The purpose of the interpretation is to show that there are possibilities of this happening. So one possibility is that there will be no need for jizya. And so he will abolish the law of jizya. The second possibility is that he will give an interpretation such that it doesn't require jizya. Because he will say that there's no more Ahlul Kitab. Because Ahlul Kitab was for the people of the book when they didn't, they had the, maybe they had some book, but it was distorted, but now I have the original. So there's no, any, it's all Al-Kitab. It's all one book in a sense. Allahu A'lam. But all my point was to show that there is a ta'wil that can be done that's legitimate and gives space of interpretation. That's beautiful. Can I just say something before you go, Sheikh? It's not a question. Sure. So I want to point out something very important that I think is very important. And that is that when Sheikh Umar Baloch is teaching, please show your faces. Unless you're a sister, I understand. But if you're a brother, at least show your face. It is very important for the teacher to see the faces of his students so he can see whether the students actually understand what he's saying or not. And I've thought about this many times and it has actually angered me very, very much. And I don't want to talk in a state of anger. I want to give advice as calm as possible, you know. But um, yani, it's, uh, it's just uh, common sense that you show your face to your teacher when he teaches you. And it's a basic uh, respect, you know. Put yourself in the position of Sheikh Mabaloj when he's sitting and he's watching just a bunch of empty screens with no faces, you know. So put yourself in his position. And he has done this now over a year. SubhanAllah, if I was in his position, I wouldn't even bother. I wouldn't even care. Like, you don't even care to show your face to me. Why would I even care to teach you? You know, and it's... Um, so, SubhanAllah, he has a lot of sabr for that. So please, people, from now on, if you're a brother, uh, I don't think there's any excuse, excuse for you to not show your face. If you're a sister, fully understood. Uh, that's understandable, you know, but uh, for the brothers, at least, no excuse, man. There's no excuse to not show your face to your teacher, you know. So Some, some brother might be have some issue. They might be at war, but listening, you know. 
there are some reason you know you cannot you cannot i cannot generalize everything no. okay so uh, and, we're not going to so, argue uh, the brother made his point yeah i mean obviously seeing the people makes a difference and if you can't do it you can't do it if you can then you should okay and so that's as simple as that um <laughs> So inshallah jazakumullah khairan. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Shaykh.